Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this We uh, are now going to begin the March 14th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So at this time, I'd like to confirm that all members of the board are present and can hear me, starting with Ken Lau. Present. Uh, Eugene Benson. Present. Melissa Tentakoulos. Present. Steve Revelak. Good evening, Madam Chair. I am Rachel Zemberry, uh, Chair of the Board. We also have uh, Kelly Linema joining us from the Department of Planning and Com Community Development. Present. Great. Uh, so thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, the first agenda item tonight is going to be the continuation of the uh, open public hearings for the warrant articles proposed for 2022 town meeting. This is the second of four nights of hearings for a total of 18 articles. Consistent with past hearings, the ARB will be hearing from the applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. The board will pose any questions to the applicants, but will reserve discussion and voting on each article to recommend action or no action until after all hearings have been completed, which is expected on April 4th. So the typical format for each article will be to hear from the department regarding the memo that they have prepared, uh, followed by up to a six minute presentation by uh, each petitioner. We will then take questions from the board followed by public comments. We'll then ask the petitioner to address any questions and take final comments from board members. So before we begin the continued public hearing, I just wanted to run through a few of the, um, of the ground rules that we follow during these open public hearings for those of you who are joining for the first time. The scope of this public hearing is uh, the subject matter as posted on the agenda. As a procedure, anyone who wishes to address the ARB on the subject matter of the agenda shall identify that you'd like to speak by raising your hand when I announce that we are ready to consider those items. To raise your hand in Zoom, please go to the participants section and uh, click the raise hands button. Uh, after being recognized to speak, you will uh, need to start your comments by giving your first, last name, and street address. Anyone addressing the board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall limit your remarks to three minutes. If time's al time allows, you may be allowed to speak more than once. Uh, that'll be up to the discretion of myself as the chair. And that will only be if you have a new and different point to make or a question to ask. But again, we'll have to um, look at that based on the time as we follow the agenda this evening. Uh, in terms of evidence, the board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of each agenda item immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence is excluded. Everyone present at the public hearing is requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval. That includes using the reaction buttons here in Zoom or any statements made or action taken at the hearing. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers or board members and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. Speakers should address your questions through myself as the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the ARB members or hearing participants. Question may or, questions may or may not be answered during the public hearing. Some may be collected and addressed uh, at a later date or uh, collected and addressed at the end of public comment. All right, so with that, we will move into our uh, first article for this evening, which is Article 31, a zoning bylaw amendment proposed uh, with administrative amendments. This was inserted at the request of the Redevelopment Board. And Kelly, I will turn it over to you to see if you would like to uh, top line the, um, the uh, comments that were, or the presentation that was made uh, by the memo that was prepared by the Planning Department. 
Thank you, Rachel. Um, Kelly Leinemann, Assistant Director of the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, what the board has before you tonight in the memo are five very simple administrative amendments. Um, these amendments are basically meant to address a couple of issues that have occurred and just catching up on a few details. Um, the first is to amend section 3.4.3D um, to be consistent with uh, the legislation signed by Governor Baker in 2021 around housing choice. And so this basically incorporates um, the exception of decisions of the board of special permits that are in compliance with that housing choice legislation, which allows for a lower threshold of a vote. The second, um, the second amendment is to basically in 2019 when the bike parking um, bylaw was amended, we sort of made it basically duplicated a section of the trans the transportation demand management section. So this is basically just to include a statement um, in the TDM methods saying if otherwise not required. So. Uh, making sure there's not a duplication of bike parking when it comes to uh, calculating TDM. The third amendment is just to strike a duplication. So there's a there's two duplicate paragraphs word for word in the zoning bylaw right now. So we're proposing to strike section 8.1.4E and just allow the other to remain, which is 8.1.5. The fourth and fifth are really just to consolidate definitions. So right now we already have the definition for group home in the definitions. We also have the definition for accessory dwelling unit in our definitions in the zoning bylaw. And this basically takes both of those definitions and it puts them both into the category of um, definitions associated with dwelling. So it doesn't actually change anything about the definitions, it just moves them into one category. And I'm happy to answer any questions about those. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you to you and uh, your colleagues at the department for putting together um, such a thorough memo on all of the articles. Uh, let's see, let's start with Ken. Any questions for Kelly? No, no, I have no questions for Article 31. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean, any questions for Kelly? Just a couple really brief um, <clears throat> either questions or observations. In the um, article that um, does the fix on the uh, bicycle parking, a lot of those lines are underlined, at least in the copy I got, but I think the only one that really needs to be underlined is unless otherwise required. So I think that was probably just some sort of formatting thing that needs to be fixed. And then I know the intention, but in moving the definition of ADU and group home to into the dwelling section, I think we should say more specifically, you know, we're moving it and deleting it from the previous location. But that otherwise, I think they all look fine. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jean. Kelly, did you have any um, any, any no, questions? Um, yeah, I think that was just a, a scriber's error for uh, section 6.1.5. And then I think being clear about what we're doing with those definitions, that's fine. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, Melissa, any questions for Kelly? Uh, no, not at this time, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Steve, any questions for Kelly? No questions, Madam Chair. Okay, and I have no questions either. So with that, uh, we will now uh, open, uh, open the meeting up to public comment for uh, Article 31, the administrative, the proposed uh, zoning bylaw amendments related to administrative amendments. Uh, so any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function and I'll give it a minute to see if anyone is interested in asking any questions on this article. All right, uh, seeing none, we will um, move on to the next article, which is Article 40, the zoning map amendment uh, to expand business districts. This was inserted at the request of James Fleming and 10 registered voters. I will first turn it over to Kelly uh, to hit any highlights that you'd like to cover from the memo prepared by the department. Hi, thank you, Rachel. Um, so the highlights from this memo that we provided to the board relate the petitioner is seeking to rezone four property or 
four properties, sorry, five properties on four parcels. Um, one is a two, uh, two unit condominium. Um, from R5 and four R2 properties into the B3 district. Um, this would essentially expand the B3 district in Capitol Square area toward um, Cambridge. We took a look at what those properties are now and what they potentially could become if they were rezoned um, and if there were any limitations on those properties if they were to be rezoned after the rezoning. Um, essentially, the current uses on those properties would be allowed to remain. They wouldn't be in conflict or there wouldn't be any nonconformancies created by the rezoning. Um, the, as the petitioner notes, the a rezoning would not require anything to be changed about these properties, but it would allow for additional uses to be put into place if those properties were sold later on or redeveloped at some point um, based on what either a future owner or current owner, um, property owner, wished to do with those properties. Um, we looked at some of the historic zoning and uh, did a little overlay, and it actually maps right onto what zoning map looked like in around the 1970s. Um, which is basically a consistent strip of business zoning. Um, and then the one other thing to note is we know, we recognize that the board has discussed a desire to consider zoning amendments to encourage commercial development along these corridors. Um, and just want to acknowledge that um, the board has already stated that if they were to embark on such a strategy, there would be a broader engagement and outreach component of this. So that's about it for the memo. Great, thank you, Kelly. Uh, so at this time, uh, James, if you could introduce yourself, first, last name and address, and uh, we welcome any comments that you'd like to make or any presentation um, about the Warren article that you've proposed. Sure. Um, so uh, James Fleming, um, 58 Oxford Street, Arlington, obviously. Um, just present through the slides as, as is and then take comment. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. So, um, uh, so this is basically my neighborhood um, overhead view of Mass Ave, which shows where all the businesses are, restaurants, bakeries, retail stores, a bunch of other stuff. Um, it's really, really nice. I have a memory from last summer. We, my wife and I were walking home from getting uh, ice cream at the movie theater and while waiting to cross Mass Ave, um, we heard the laughter, clinking of plate bear and whatever else they, whatever else they use in a restaurant. Um, and it reminded me of how much we enjoyed being around other people, just enjoying themselves, doing what they do, and that it was really fulfilling to where, to live where we live because of how active it is. There's a lot of people out in the street, just doing whatever. It's hard to explain, but basically just I enjoy being around people doing what they do. And so my thought was, is it possible to, to double down on that, whatever that feeling is that I have by allowing you know, slightly more business, slightly more people in the in the neighborhood, um, which may, probably means adding more commercial space. Uh, next slide. Fantastic. So um, so this so I, I ended up walking down Mass Ave and, and trying as best I could to mark out the locations that had a business or that uh, uh, were going to have a business. There was one that has one going in right now, um, and that they're basically full. The block that has the, the block in red there is the one that has three vacancies and that one was the subject of a redevelopment proposal that went before you last year. So basically I'm attributing that's why they haven't filled the vacancies because they're trying to figure out what to do with the property. Um, so um, yeah, so if the storefronts are all full, then there really isn't much of an opportunity to add more business to the neighborhood. So you basically have to get you have to add more. Um, and so that's what the rezoning proposal would do is it would take the business district and they would just extend it just a little bit um, up until uh, the other B2 district, which is slightly to the east. Um, so just a nice, it's like satisfying to fill the gap in the zoning. Um, and so by changing to B3, it would allow it to become either commercial or um, if someone decided to redevelop it, they could turn it into uh, mixed use with the ground floor retail. And the reason I only chose four is that I had to submit letters to all the abutters, which costs $4 a letter. So keeping it small was a very high priority. Um, and also I really wanted to reach out to everyone individually and for the owners and figure out you know, what their opinions were. Um, and doing that for a, a large swath would be just, I wouldn't have the brain space to do it. So I decided we'll start small and if it succeeds and I get the outcome I'm looking for, then maybe we take it further from there. 
Uh, next slide. Sorry, uh, I should I should I should the next slide. This is the area being rezoned. Um, fantastic. Uh, so uh, 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 I was able to get some historical zoning maps, and I realized that these used to be business uh, a long time ago, and then sometime in the 1970s they stopped being business. Uh, they, there was a townwide rezoning that um, changed them to whatever they were at the time. So this would just put them back to being what they were back then, which uh, allowed restaurants and retail and a bunch of other stuff. Um, next. Um, Kelly already basically mentioned this, uh, that uh, basically what's there now either uh, would be continue to be allowed um, under the under the new zoning uh, or would be uh, allowed only by special permit, but in either case, you don't have to make changes and nothing would be out of conformance. Um, the other thing is, and I know that I don't think Dana Mann is here. Um, I, I, in starting this, I wanted to make sure that if, if this was done, there would basically be no impact negatively on the property owners. So I asked uh, the assessor's office about assessments and what Dana had said was that as long as if the zoning changes, but they don't make any physical adjustments to the building, so they don't change use, so they don't extend it, then um, nothing would change about the assessment because the property tax rate is the same commercial or residential. Um, and there's nothing different about the uses that would, um, or sorry, there's nothing different about the zoning that would cause the valuation to go up or to go down. Um, so that basically was like, well, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a negative downside to doing this. So here we are. Uh, next. Um, so uh, the other uh, reason that I was thinking to do this is that um, from the research, this is in research I've done for a different warrant article, but um, I think it bears repeating um, that the if you have commercial use, it makes really good use of the land tax wise. Um, these are a couple properties in, um, well, actually, I'll start. The one on the left is one of the properties to be rezoned. It's an apartment building. Um, right now, it's worth about $7 million an acre. Um, so for that land area, that's how much, that's the value we get to tax. Um, and then these, the two buildings on the right are a um, set of mixed use buildings up in Arlington Heights where I used to live, um, which are two stories and they are worth about double the amount of money per, per unit of land they use. So I was like, well, it seems like commercial use makes really, really good use money-wise of the land, in addition to being all the nice things about having an active neighborhood and um, things like that. And if these properties were rezoned to B3, we would be able to have them be, be mixed use. Next slide. And you're, you're almost out of, out of time. Yep. Yeah, so I know, I'm almost done. That. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, um, the last is that um, this is sort of an extreme example. This is a one story leader bank branch in my neighborhood, um, which is uh, worth as much per unit of land as a eight story apartment building in Arlington Center. So I was thinking, well, why the heck wouldn't we allow more commercial use just in general? Um, it seems like it's worth it. Um, next slide. So in summary, um, the rezoning more opportunity for business, which personally I want for my neighborhood. It seems like it'd be really nice to have more opportunity. Um, it doesn't seem to negatively affect any of the property owners, and that in general, commercial and mixed use seem to put really, make really good use of the land we have in town. Thank you. Great. Thank you, James. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, I, I will one, one other thing. Um, of the, I was only able to reach four or five owners, just in general, one, one I was never able to reach. Um, one is opposed, and I know he submitted a public comment. Um, and three that I was able to reach were in favor, but only one actually filed a letter or some sort of public comment. Great, thank you. That was going to be my first question. <laughs> okay, so with that, um, I appreciate your presentation, James, and I will ask Ken uh, if he has any questions or comments uh, to share with you. Uh, hi, uh, thanks, James, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, you follow up with us as far as uh, reaching out to the owners of the property, and I appreciate that. Um, I think having a majority of them interested um, in, um, I guess this is called upzoning, uh, as best I can uh, say, and more or less a continuation of what's on Mass Ave, which was there before, I think is good. So um, right now I'm very supportive of this, uh, what you're trying to do here. I think it look, I think it's, it, it um, helps tie in the fabric where it's no longer as, as hodgepodge as it was before. I wasn't quite sure what happened, why where it, was, where it once was all business, 
then all of a sudden it was down zone to, to be um, residential uh, and um, not allow it to, uh, you know, Mass, Mass Ave, which is a pretty wide street to grow. I think the opportunity there is also a good place to be picked where there are very wide streets and this allows um, um, the, the lower floors to actually activate and engage the uh, sidewalks and have, uh, have maybe seating areas or uh, live areas out there. So I think that's a good thing. So um, I'm supportive of this and uh, thank you for bringing this up. Great, thank you, Ken. Jean, any questions or comments for James? Um, the only comment is I agree with uh, what Ken said. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, Melissa, any questions or comments for James? Um, if James or Kelly, could you remind everyone here how this fits in with the goals of the master plan um, and the ARB? Because I think, you know, as you know, Ken and Jean said that, you know, we are probably supportive of this, but for me, it's helpful. And I think for the residents, as we look to these changes, they're plugged into greater, bigger goals that we have, as a community have stated versus individual desires. So we're trying to, you know, connect it. And I would like to hear you explain that and share that. Thanks. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it supports the master plan. Kelly, I'm sure, has the specific language. Um, I, I remember the, the master plan's goal was basically street activation, make the commercial districts more lively. And I think there was something about just sort of a hodgepodge of zoning fixed, and I guess this kind of addresses that. Uh, Kelly, please step in and save me. <laughs> Sorry, you, you talked first. Um, so no, it's really about enlivening the, the business districts. There's not a lot in the master plan on this, but um, the other thing is just looking at the ARB goals for 2022, um, which includes specifically the action to consider zoning amendments to encourage commercial development along the Massachusetts Avenue and Broadway corridors. Um, and additionally, uh, looked at the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan, which talked about this a little bit more, much more extensively focused on Arlington Heights, but I think expanding that throughout the town overall, um, thinking about just recommendations and additional action regarding zoning, um, just to a de desire to attract, to address the zoning in the business districts um, more broadly to try to encourage greater commercial development and um, improving, improving the corridors overall. Great, thank you, Kelly and James. Melissa, any other comments or questions? Um, no, thank you for reinforcing that. I appreciate that. Great, thank you, Melissa. Steve, any questions or comments? Uh, one comment and one question. Um, I was involved in the effort to recodify the zoning bylaw back in 2018. And one of the goals that we had at the beginning of that project was to see if um, you know, it might be better, it, if it would be possible to consolidate some of the business districts. Um, we had to drop that just because at the time it turned out to be more work than we had the capacity to do. Um, but this is sort of, had that work on forward, I you know, envision it having looked something like this. Uh, the question I have uh, for Mr. Fleming through you, Madam Chair, um, and this is a devil's advocate question. Uh, one of the comments I think that came, I believe that came in this afternoon, basic, said, something, sub, said something to the effect of, um, you know, you know, it, uh, it had the sentiment that Arlington should concentrate on filling its existing storefronts before it considers making room for any more. And I was just wondering what your reaction to that would be. Uh, Steve, is that a question for uh, James or for uh, that you'd like Kelly to that address is a, in terms of the efforts? That is a question for Mr. Fleming. Okay, so James, why don't you um, sure. take a take a first pass at that one? So, so. Uh, the question is, uh, why expand the commercial district if we have vacancies in other commercial districts? Correct. That, that's essentially what I, how I interpreted it, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so my thought on this is that you need enough residents in the close proximity to a business district to make it really viable. And East Arlington by far has the most people per unit of land area, whatever you want, per, per square mile. Um, 
And so it's just, it's easier to have a business open here that is, that serves the local residents because there are more people around it. So as to why, like when I, I remember when I lived in the Heights, there were a bunch of vacancies. I don't know the particulars as to why they were vacant. I'm sure there was, there might be other factors, but one reason I guess might be that there weren't as many people in the area around it. Um, but I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm speculating. I, I would imagine it's something to do with the amount of people that can support the business district. Um, and so and given that there were, there didn't seem to be any vacancies that couldn't be explained by an owner trying to figure out what they were trying to do with the property, said to me that if anywhere could have more commercial, it would be East Arlington, um, which is why, why this part of town. And also why I live here, so I get to benefit from it if it happens. Thank you, James. Uh, Ken, you look like you have something to add on this topic. Yeah, I just want to uh, add on to uh, James's uh, comment uh, for Steve here. Some of uh, the vacancies are not because they're, um, they're because they're older spaces that don't quite adequately address um, tenants moving in. They're small, cut up little spaces. They're not deep enough. There's not enough parking, and so that's why there's some empty spaces. And by having them empty, and we're not creating more. Um, commercial space because they're empty is I don't think is a great way to go because these new ones will address those issues um, and those other ones may fill in later on when there's more uh, a little more density and there's enough more a little more foot traffic but uh, with these new ones that we that, that, that may that may or may not go in there would address some of those issues right away and so it's not like well, well, there's an empty store here. You got to fill it up before we give you more stores. It doesn't work that way. It, it works with what space is there, the parking, as Jane said earlier, the foot traffic, the size of it, the age of it. Um, you know, no one's going to actually invest in a commercial space if it's too small and they can't grow, or it's just cost to uh, cost prohibitive to fix the place up because it's so old. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Great. Thank you, Ken. Steve, any follow up questions or comments? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Fleming and Mr. Lau. All right, thank you, Steve. And I think I'll just, um, my only comment is, you know, again, I, I agree with the others who supported this. What um, I appreciate about this is that it supports the potential of the space. I don't think anybody on the board, and, and James, you certainly, um, it's not done with the expectation that any of these property owners are potentially looking to to turn over their property in the in the near future, but what we're trying to do is um, is create potential um, for for the future. Uh, should should that be something? Sure. Should the property turn over? Yeah, yeah. My my expectation is this. To me, this is a small little bet on my neighborhood that it'll happen. And if it doesn't happen, then oh well. Then then you know I get to I still get to live in a nice neighborhood with local business, and and that's that. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from the board before we open this up for public comment? All right, with that, uh, I will now open this up for public comment. Uh, so anyone wishing to speak about Article 40, please use the raise hand function. I'll remind everyone to please introduce yourself by your first, last name and address, and you'll have up to three minutes to make your comments. Uh, so the first speaker this evening will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, I first want to ask sort of a, a, a pro forma question, an obvious question. I want to make sure, uh, I want to ask Mr. Fleming if, if he or any of the other folks that signed this um, for the inclusion of this article in the uh, warrant this year have any financial interest in any of those properties. Uh I'll, I'll go ahead and um, did you have other questions? What I'd like yes. to do is, is um, yes, do. collect your questions and then that, that'll end your time and I'll ask James to respond. Uh, okay. Um, yes, I have other questions. Um, I want to um, uh, sort of build on what Mr. Revelak had to offer in terms of um, filling up the spaces with the devil's advocate question. I think there are probably uh, a number of reasons why storefronts are, are empty in town of which a significant amount are, 
and I did hear what Mr. Lau had to say. Um, I'm not sure that that's uh, wholly the reason to do with them being old and not necessarily convenient spaces. I think all you have to do is look at the high school, the one built next to the high school um, on the first floor that uh, perhaps still is empty, but certainly remained empty, built brand new construction straight up from the sidewalk um, that remained empty for a while, even though it had all the modern conveniences built in, I'm quite sure. Um, and, and I agree, we need to, before we, I think before we develop any more uh, business space like this, um, I think we need to work a whole lot harder on filling up the spaces that we have empty, which are significant in town. Um, I, I, I also know uh, Mr. Lau spoke with in terms of kind of a hodgepodge going from business to residential to business. And honestly, I don't find that a, a, a downside. I find that's what makes Arlington interesting. Along Mass Ave, there's a very large tree in particular in front of the property that was shown uh, at 155, I believe it was, Mass Ave, that would, uh, would not last very long, quite clearly, if this was developed in a, in a commercial space, in, in my opinion. I think variety is good, not, not necessarily bad along Mass Ave. Um, and I guess lastly, I'd ask kind of a rhetorical question, why would we argue that an eight-story apartment building of the one picture in the presentation is an improvement over the two two-story uh, buildings that were shown uh, also in the presentation as, uh, as a good thing, the two that are there on the heights that flank uh, Park Ave. So uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I have to comment on, but I would like to have that other, that particular question answered. Sure, thank you, Steve. So um, James, I think if you could answer uh, that first question, um, whether or not you have any financial interest in, in these uh, four lots or five properties, that would be great. And um, then I see Ken with his hand up, so. Sure, uh, no financial interest whatsoever. Great, thank you. Um, and Ken, it looks like you had a, a clarification to one of the questions that were just posed. Yes, I, I just want to clarify with uh, Steve that the property he's mentioning uh, where the ground floor is, he says is empty, is not empty. That ground, uh, that ground floor space is a daycare center. And um, it, it, normally when that thing opened up, it took about a year to get in, but that's how long it takes to go through all the paperwork with the, with, uh, with the state to get all the licensing and everything else. That's why it remained empty for that year while they're getting their licenses. And they have been there all that time since uh, they got the license, it has been opened even through the COVID and everything else. They might have slowed down or, sl or closed up a little bit during that uh, pandemic, but that store, that space was occupied and it's, it's fitted. So I just wanna make it clear that, you know, that's not, th that one there is not quite right. Okay, thank you, Ken. Appreciate the clarification. Um, let's see, so let's move on to Actually, our Rachel, next speaker. There, didn't Steve have another, he had another question. I think those are those are the only questions I think uh, James said I'd, I'd like to address at this time. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, so the next speaker this evening will be um, Adam uh, Dozenberry. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. It's uh, Adam Dozenberry, Marathon Street. Uh, just a couple of, of, of notes for everybody. Uh, when we're working with uh, zoning laws, I, I'd much rather see uh, I'm generally uh, against these wholesale zoning changes um, because you'll come to find that once this is done, they'll beat the town and the uh, community members will have a lot less say control over what exactly is could potentially be put in these spaces uh, called as right uh, uh, stuff that is done on uh, things that can be put on the property where the planning board comes in, they come into a planning board as long as it meets the general criteria, it's pretty much Going to be allowed to go in. Uh, the way to address something like this, I would prefer to see is, you know, a developer comes in, they want to, they want to put something in, they come before the board of appeals of the town, then we get to actually have a discussion. We actually get the community involved, we actually get the neighbors involved. We can actually have more control over the way the building, the property looks and feels with the rest of the community. If you do these wholesale uh, zoning changes, a lot of that goes out the window. Uh, the other, so uh, it's, you know, it, it would be a better, it would be better just to leave it where it is and then let developers come in, 
uh, and request a specific zoning change, and then we have the, we have the discussion and we have more control. Uh, second of all, uh, you know, they're they're going back to the the open storefronts. There are at least three or four vacant storefronts right on Mass Ave, right here in East Arlington. Uh, 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 and so, uh, and then also we're going to talk about the parking. Mr. Uh, uh, Kin, I believe, was talking about the parking. There's very limited parking out there as it is now. Uh, so if we're talking about adding more business space, we're going to have more businesses and people looking looking for parking. So and traffic on Mass Ave. Uh, so I mean, I, I, and so I like to think that uh, we have we would want to do this in a way that the town has more control over what goes in, uh, and doing wholesale zoning just for the sake of doing wholesale rezoning is not the way to do that. Uh, you know, there needs to be ways to uh, encourage current landowners, current landlords to redu maybe reduce their uh, rents and that sort of stuff to get that, to allow people to come in, uh, to fill these vacant spots. Uh, again, the type of stores we want, but uh, I think the, 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 the focus should be on our existing uh, stock and helping out our, la our landlords to Give them enticement to bring in other people to fill their spaces, not just throwing up a whole bunch of buildings uh, that could potentially rain, remain vacant uh, once they're up. So, uh, you know, please consider not doing wholesale uh, rezoning and let's wait for a developer to come in and then we can have a discussion as a community about a particular project with a particular development. And then if it, everything you. fits out, uh, do, do the rezoning then. Thank you. You're a time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's see. I think what I'd like to do is after all the public comment is is complete. Um, I think the board will address the timing that it takes um, with the what you proposed as uh, developer led zoning changes and just why that um, how that's different than, than what's being proposed. Uh, so the next speaker will be Elizabeth Dre. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. Um, I have just a, a question um, as someone newer to zoning. So when I look at those 19 units, they uh, appear to be some of probably more mid-level or affordable housing units that we have here in Arlington. And so I'm wondering um, if there's concern that making rezoning into mixed use uh, will make that more uh, give more incentive to developers to tear them down and rebuild um, and thus destroy 19 units um, that seem to be are probably sort of more of the mid to, to more affordable housing. Um, and so is that, you know, is that a, a legitimate concern? Um, is that a possibility? And if it can currently be done using um, get, with a special permit. Then why uh, why do that? Like why risk that we are going to incentivize developers to come and tear down some of our more affordable housing, replace it with what will more, right most likely be more expensive luxury apartments or condos? Um, thank you. Uh Absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm not sure that I necessarily followed the last part of your um, question, uh, because what is being proposed in terms of the change of use are uses that are not currently um, allowed uh, by right or by special permit even um, within those districts. So that, that's really the crux of the change is to um, create that opportunity which is just that it's an it's an opportunity. It's certainly it would be a challenging pro forma, I think, to identify that um, pulling down a an apartment building of that of that size would um, be an, an economic win to 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 change that fully, but especially that apartment building fully over to commercial. I think again, what um, the proponent is doing is looking to um, to connect. The zoning fabric and uh, create potential opportunity. Although again, it's it's hard for anyone to put their finger in the wind and and identify specifically um, specifically again what what that pro forma would would look like at this point. Um, so 
let's go to the, the next speaker. Uh, the next person on our list is uh, Bill Goff. Yeah, hi, thank you, Madam Chair. You can hear me okay? I can, thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Phil Goff. I live at 94 Grafton Street, so just a handful of blocks away from um, the sites in question here. Um, I think some good points are being made, certainly on both sides, and I'm not unsympathetic to some of the issues, especially the potential loss of what could be or what likely is you know, relatively affordable housing out there. Um, despite that, I, I am supportive of this article and I do hope that the ARB uh, moves it forward um, to town meeting. I think the block in question, it very much is a gap in the continuity of the retail streetscape along Mass Ave. And you know, having multi-floor mixed use buildings potentially uh, in the future along Mass Ave, I think that is the future um, ultimately. So I think changing the zoning does make sense and certainly it would be consistent with not just the master plan, but I can't even think of others. But you know, I've been at numerous I go to planning meetings all the time in the town of Arlington. There's been definitely been a few that I've been to different processes where there's always talk about, we want mixed use buildings. We wanna have a bit, you know, a lot of people are okay with density, but just along Mass Ave, maybe on Broadway, just along Mass Ave. So I think this is an opportunity to do it. So I think it is consistent with a lot of our policies and the master plan, the continuity of the, um, and the ongoing walkability of Capitol Square, I think would be enhanced with a zoning, this is a better fit for zoning. So I think that would be consistent. Um, and I think, you know, more opportunities for smaller neighborhood uh, serving businesses that residents like me and others who live nearby. Um, I know the proponent lives nearby. We could walk and bike too. I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, I know clearly we all know that there are empty storefronts, um, a couple in Capitol Square and elsewhere. And I think that, you know, changing the zoning doesn't make, you know, an automatic change to um, you know, the building fabric that's out there, if market conditions change and the developer sort of understands that there is an opportunity to build a mixed use building and there's a high likelihood that business is going to locate there. Um, I think that the, the market, so to speak, would sort of, you know, decide in that case. So that isn't something I, I worry about personally too, too much. So again, um, I think B3 is the right zoning for uh, this block on Mass Ave, given that it is so close to Capitol Square. Um, and I do um, recommend that ARB approve this article. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Will McMillan. You there? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Chairwoman, and thank you for just this people who care about our neighborhood so much. I, my name is Will McMillan. I live at 11 Egerton Road, which is the first house behind the the building that has uh, Cambridge Savings Bank and the optician and the little gym and a huge parking lot that I guess that a lot of people use informally when they want to go to the Capitol and whatnot. And I apologize for my ignorance, um, but if someone could give like a one minute explanation of what would be allowed if this were to change does it mean that the houses could theoretically be sold torn down and a big three possibly four story like they want to do over where christo's grocery store used to be is that we could have another one of those that would be retail on the first floor and then housing on top of that or does it mean that the houses that exist there could sort of have those funny cancerous storefronts grafted onto the front of them so that uh like uh dags the current dags is is sort of a, a store that's inside what looks like it used to be a regular housing stock and anyone have any tiny bit of historical perspective about why in the 1970s I mean, maybe that was part of when the T was going to be extended, possibly into Arlington. I don't know why it got turned backwards. I'm just, I'm just curious about all of that. And then I'm wondering if anyone's going to um, speak to the one current owner who is not a fan of this and just explain what her or his perspectives would be. I have no opinion about this. Again, I love that so many people care about this neighborhood. I've lived here almost 30 years and I bike everywhere or walk everywhere and I 
love supporting our local businesses. Great, thank you. I think those are two good questions for clarification. Um, let's see, just in terms of a historical perspective, I'll just give you a, a really brief snippet um, and then um, we can certainly expand upon this, this later. But basically in the, in the 70s, um, there, where, where previously some of the business corridor had been zoned um, very consistently throughout, where there were um, non-conforming uses, everything was down zoned to basically whatever was on that, that lot. So if there was a house there, it went from a business to a residential district based on whatever was there. I think that's a very, very simple way of talking about a very long process that was much more complicated. Um, and there, there are other pieces within that, but, but that is a lot of um, what, we're, what we're seeing. And Kelly, if there's anything else you wanted to add to the historical perspective, um, I'll ask you. Sure. I think this was, this was probably around the same time as there was an apartment moratorium um, and the town studied whether um, it was interested in pursuing more um, taller apartment buildings along Mass Ave and Broadway Corridor. And that was, so there was a moratorium and then the zoning was basically zoning, which is usually used as a vision for what the community wants um, to have, um, was basically altered to preserve portions of Mass Ave the way that they were at the time. Great, thank you. And then Kelly, if you could also give a brief description of just what is allowed within a, a B3 district. Um, I'm sure that there are other people on the phone or, or on the call today who are, who are unclear as to what is allowed as of right. Sure, and this is a pretty long list and I would point anyone to the memo um, on page five of the memo that uh, the planning department provided to the board, which is included in the agenda. This is all uh, listed out. Um, but there are a number of uses that are allowed by right um, in the B3 district. Uh, it's just, maybe just the highlights. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think just thinking about, thinking about like there are residential uses that are allowed by right, both single, two family, duplex dwellings, group homes, dormitories. Um, but there's a lot of institutional and agricultural uses. Most of the uses that are allowed by right are very small. And so what's allowed by right is usually things that are less than 2,000 or, 2, or 3,000 square foot footprint. So for like commercial office, restaurant, et cetera. Um, anything larger than that requires a special permit. Um, and that because it's a long mass avenue, and especially if there's more than six units, if you're looking at a mixed use building, that would have to go through the environmental design review um, process with the redevelopment board with community engagement and abutter notices. So um, anybody could come and hear and, and comment on what that proposal would be. So it is, a, it is a participatory public process for any kind of redevelopment that would occur. And also just to note that it would also be subject to a lot of dimensional constraints, FAR, height, setbacks, et cetera, that are all prescribed in the zoning bylaw. Great, thank you, Kelly. I think that was very helpful. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be uh, Stacy BG. Is Stacy BG with us? Hi, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes. She's actually in the same room with me, but her uh, her mute would unmute, so I'm going to give her my computer. Okay, that's great. If you could please Sorry address about her. That. No problem. Um, Stacy, if you could address. Just turn the volume down on my computer so there's not an echo. I'm, uh, apologies for technical difficulties. No worries. <laughs> Sure, if you could just introduce yourself first, last I name and address, um, please, please go ahead. Yes, we can hear Hold you. on, I can't hear you. I think the computer is coming up muted. Sorry, one moment. No worries. Okay, okay now I can hear you. I, okay, you, great. You can hear me still? We can, yep. If you could just introduce okay. yourself first, last, and address, um, and then please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stacey Pupavall-Stenarakis, 8 Marathon Street, uh, right off of Mass Ave here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and to the board for, of course, allowing us this opportunity um, to speak. Um, that being said, I understand, you know, why there's a limit here. So of uh, only three minutes, so I'm going to have to try to pick and choose my points here, and hopefully I'm picking and choosing the most salient ones. Um, I am just very concerned about, um, as Adam said earlier, about this 
turning into a business district where anything that wants to come in has a buy right in the future. Um, I'm not opposed to businesses being there in the future. I do think it would, I feel it would be better to, when the time comes, if a business wants to develop, uh, say, this is what we want to do and, and evaluate it on a case by case basis. Um, I am actually, we are actually butters to the property. I'm not sure if anybody else uh, who spoke yet is. Um, it sounds like some of you guys are several blocks away. Um, I, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go down my list and, and pick and choose because of my time limit here. I, I guess one of my concerns, I, when you look at the map, yes, when you look at the map, overhead map and it's just squares, I see how it looks like, yeah, everything else around it is. But when you live here on Marathon Street, we do, you can really, it's hard, not necessarily easy to tell from Marathon, or excuse me, from Massive, how far set back the building is onto Marathon Street and how much turning that into business, particular, particular kind of businesses could affect those of us who live right across the street from the property. Um, I have concerns with turning, to, with turning into business. And for example, what Marathon, one of the things is Marathon Street is one way. And there are, and so those people who live in the apartment building now, they know not to come out and turn right onto Marathon Street. If we turn into a business, even no matter how many signs you put there saying that's one way, people can easily miss it or just ignore it and turn the wrong way onto, Mass, onto Marathon Street and cause all sorts of accidents. I'm concerned also too is, is um, Again, I'm not against all businesses. I wouldn't be against, say, a restaurant with alcohol necessarily per se, but I'd want to see it at the time. Oh, Just oh, as a good answer, oh, oh, I apologize. I guess my dog has some comments oh, oh, on this. No <laughs> problem. Um, this is what happens in Zoom talk. Part of the Zoom world. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just as, as a bit of an antidote, and again, keeping in mind that this is without a business here and that and just residential, because we are a little bit set back. Uh, there was recently, maybe about a few months ago or so, back, I go back and check my records and check the date. Um, I had walked out of the front door of our house and I had discovered in the middle of our steps uh, a folded up face mask and a, like a cardboard tube that said Apostle, which is a marijuana store up in the Heights. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not against uh, uh, marijuana being legalized. My concern, I, I, my concern is I went back and looked at our security camera video because we fortunately have security camera video if something happens. And what had happened is there were some people just sitting in the middle of our front steps, smoking, getting high and chatting. And it looks like what happened is my fiance went out because it must've been a Sunday night to bring the barrels out to the front yard. They heard the front door and went really quickly running. So if we do have like a, a we do rezone, this is something that would allow a restaurant. We have a restaurant that serves alcohol and we get all sorts of drunk people coming there. Um, yeah. How close uh, am I to I, my time? Do I need to like wait to maybe you'll circle back and get to my other points? Um, what, what I'd actually ask you to do, um, you're more than welcome to submit um, written any written um, points that you'd like to make to, mm -hmm. to the ARB and we will include those as part of our um, meeting minutes for, for um, or for part, part of the meeting materials so as will be posted um, if you have anything else that you'd like to share. Okay, okay, I okay. appreciate that. I'll, 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 I'll try, I'm not so great. And so it's not as easy for me to put stuff in writing as it is in oral, but I just make one more quick point. What's my one uh, more quick statement, well, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry because I, I have to be consistent in the way that I, um, that I, that I let everybody uh, move forward. So we are, we are at time. Um, so I do apologize, but you, like I said, you're more than welcome to submit anything that you, that you'd like to in the future. Or again, we'll have an open forum at the end of the meeting. You're more than welcome to continue at that point. Thank okay, you. I hope I have that opportunity then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be um, uh, Marcy Fukuvalas. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounced your last name. Actually, that's excellent pronunciation. Congratulations. Right. That doesn't happen too often. Um, yeah, so I'll try to be brief and I appreciate the opportunity to be able Thank you. to- Thank you. Can, can I just remind you, uh, yes, if you could just um, introduce right. yourself first, right. last name and yes. address. Yes, Thank you. of course. Thank you, yes. Um, so my name is Marcy Bukavalas. I'm also on Marathon Street, um, but we've been there. The thing is, we've been there for generations and generations. Um, you know, parents, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. So we're old neighbors, essentially. Um, and it's, it's a very quiet, um, very pleasant uh, neighborhood, essentially, very congenial neighborhood. Um, I have some concerns. I'll only highlight maybe one or two, if it's the sake of time, because I know there's probably many other people you need to get to at this point. Um, I, I concur with the issue 
of uh, having potentially having a business on the corner of this one way quiet street that's a neighborhood um, with children and everything. Um, and um, I see this as a potential safety issue. Um, you have people, if it's going to be a business, you have parking and the parking might be behind that particular building uh, on the corner of Maristrand Street, if something were to be done with that. And it's a very serious safety issue concern for the entire neighborhood. Um, the other one uh, of many items that I have here listed um, is the anytime you increase density, and it would be an increase in density, um, you there's a potential degradation of the value of the neighborhood and consequently the value of the property too. Uh, again, if you have a business there and you have parking and you have this quiet neighborhood transformed into something else. Um, so those are my just very few comments. There are many others, but I appreciate the opportunity um, to actually put, to put this into writing. And I have actually a specific question for James. Um, thank you for very, your very comprehensive um, presentation, James. I was wondering, do you actually live in this particular affected area? Uh, thank you. I, I'm happy to, to have James uh, answer that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. So we don't live there right now. We are in the process of renovating a house at 15 Melrose Street. Um, with any luck, we'll be there by the end of the year. Um, so basically, if anything happens in this particular area, we'll be able to see it from our front porch. So kind of yes, uh, future yes. Great. Thank you, James. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Thomas. Uh, Thomas Alor, Thomas Alor. Hi, yes. Hi, Tom Alor, 151 Massachusetts Avenue. I live in one of the affected residences that this proposal uh, impacts. Um, I concur with um, the last speaker, great points about building a business at, at Marathon Street, the one way um, is a huge safety concern, right? So there's a, there's a couple of, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to start off with first, you know, understanding that <clears throat> All the uh, petitioners that have signed this petition, they are not um, residences of either the any of the addresses that are impacted. Um, as far as owners supporting it, I know of no owners that are supporting this uh, proposal. So um, I'm not sure, you know, as far as uh, you know what was said earlier, you know what what the case is. But I've tried to reach out to my neighbors in such a short amount of time, have been been unable to. Um, other other reasons for uh, you know kind of looking at this holistically. Let's talk about trees. Someone mentioned it, right? I live uh, 151 Mass Ave. We have a beautiful magnolia tree, a cherry tree. Next to us is a big apartment building that was called out in the presentation. Has two huge maple trees, and next to us has big pine trees, right? So in the town plan, Arlington actually calls out you know the uh, the desire for tree lined streets. So this would definitely impact that. Um, when you look at, um, you know, overall safety, um, has, has there been any traffic studies based on something coming in here that is, both, is mixed use, right? So there's a bus lane, there's a bike lane, there's only 956 parking spaces in all of town. So what, what has the town done, you know, to be so readily agreeable on supporting this proposal? before any traffic studies have been done or any parking studies have been done. So um, that's you know, a huge concern for us. When you look at the B3 zoning, it's at best elusive. And I know that you've done a great job explaining it, but there, um, in fact, you know, before I saw the agenda tonight, my definition was that there are no property abutment clauses, meaning my neighbor could build right up next to the property line. So does East Arlington want to live through a construction project that um, right now could, you know, could be scoped for two years, but with supply chain constraints, we're probably looking at a three to five year project. Um, additionally, when you look at you know, overall, the, um, just the sense of the community and the businesses that are here, you know, this is a great mixed use of people. You know, we're, just, we're just looking at a couple of things in this proposal that came out to me. Number one, was tax money that could equate for the town. And number two, 
I felt it overlooked the actual human factor. There are people that live in these residences. There are people that have lived next door that can only afford to live there. I myself had to work 25 years to afford Arlington. We sent our kids to high school here. You know, they grew up in this town. And I think we're really uh, not looking at the bigger picture from a holistic perspective, safety concern, parking concerns, you know, community concerns, as well as look at your local businesses Thank that you. have contributed to this town. Thanks, you're so, in time. I appreciate your perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Alex Bagnell. Hi, um, Alex Bagnell, Wyman Street. Uh, the housing debate in Arlington is contentious, uh, but one thing that both sides of it seem to agree on is that we could use more commercial uses to help diversify our tax base. And changing a few anomalous residentially zoned parcels in one of our business districts back to their historical zoning seems like an obvious and easy step to take. At the same time, it allows for mixed use, allowing for the possibility of adding much needed housing in a walkable neighborhood along a transit corridor, uh, contributing to, I think, our overall goal of less car usage. Um, as this board is experienced with projects like the Hotel Lexington, Arlington spot zoning uh, creates unnecessary barriers to development. Uh, it makes no sense for abutting parcels on Mass Ave to have different zoning rules. Consistent zoning of these parcels increases the possibility that a new development on one or maybe even more of these parcels could actually trigger our inclusionary zoning bylaw, creating capital A affordable housing. Uh, my wife and I were two of the signers of this partition and no, we have no financial interest in these properties other than we would like to be able to walk down and support more businesses in the Capitol Square area. Uh, now, parenthetically, we own a house within one lot of Mass Ave and adjacent to a B-zoned parcel on a one-way street with a lot of kids. And we're all very happy here and none of our kids have been run over. Um, and the business on the corner, frankly, seems to have very little impact on our traffic. Uh, we and the neighbors like it very much. And I uh, strongly urge you to support this article. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, during the discussion, I've been looking at the zoning map for this neighborhood, and I can see the logic behind trying to fill in this one block gap between a B2 and a B3 district. Um, what I'm wondering is why isn't it being considered to make this a B2 rather than uh, the much more um, dense or rather higher and um, re less restrictive requirements for a B3? Seems like a B2 neighborhood business district better describes this block than a, a B3. So I hope the board will give thought to uh, the three options, leaving it the way it is, making it a B2 or making it a B3. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Stephanie Hansel. Hi, thank you. Stephanie Hansel here. I live on Cleveland Street. Um, I have some mixed feelings on this proposed article. I do appreciate the desire to increase opportunities for business space in East Arlington, but I don't really see a real plan here. This is the redevelopment board, but where's the actual redevelopment? There's no proposal by an owner. There's no business person coming in with, with a real proposal to establish a business. It's just someone who kind of thought it might be nice if these properties were rezoned to the business district. I personally abut a dist the business district and I would be a little bit annoyed if someone tried to rezone my property without my permission. So I really believe that we should hear more from the affected tenants who might potentially be displaced so that owners could rent to businesses and get a lot more money from that or the building could be torn down and rebuilt. Um, and I do agree with some previous comments that if there is an actual proposal to redevelop a spot, let's consider that. I think this sort of, you know, wholesale, let's just change it because we think it could be nice, could be uh, something that backfires on us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Sanjay Newton. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me, good evening. Sanjay Newton, Ottawa Road. Um, 
I support this this proposal, and and I think it's a really good way about thinking uh, holistically about what this map should look like. Um, and I, I'm I'm glad to see um, some consistency being brought to it, rather than you know the history that the uh, chair mentioned earlier of you know let's take what's there and apply uh, a zone to it, um, and thinking about what what could or or might be um, the opportunity for Arlington in the future. Um, I think that I think I'll leave it right there and just say, you know, I hope that you'll support this and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak on Article 40? All right, seeing none, I will uh, turn this back to the board for any um, additional thoughts or questions. I'll start with uh, Jean. Yeah, a few thoughts. I, I guess one is people who own the property can also ask that their property be rezoned. So, you know, whether um, the people who signed the petition have an interest in the property or not really doesn't matter. What matters is whether we think it's the right thing to do for the neighbors, the neighborhood, and the town. Um, Addressing the idea that gee, just anything could go here without any approval, I just want to emphasize that most things would require a special permit and environmental design review by the redevelopment board before they can be put on the property. And the owners may choose not to do anything um, with the property at the same time. Um, I guess the only other thing I would mention is Unfortunately, because it takes a year to get to town meeting with zoning changes, you usually don't have a situation where somebody comes in and says, gee, I'd like to buy this property, but you know, I need to have the zoning change. That would more likely to be happening in a city where it could go to the city council or whatever their zoning agency is and get zoning done more quickly. But when you're talking about a town and town government, it tends not to work that way. It tends to work that um, you have to deal with, usually with the zoning that's there. And so what this would just do is to provide uh, some extra options to what can happen to the property. I'm not expressing an opinion at this point, whether it's a good or bad idea, but just saying that a few of the comments, I think are ones I wanted to respond to. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jean, and I appreciate you addressing the timetable for um, developer-led zoning changes as well. That was one comment we had said we'd return to. Uh, Kim, any uh, additional thoughts or questions for James before we move on to the next? No, I, I totally concur with uh, Jean about this. Uh, I think um, a lot of people are um, a concern, and I respect that concern, uh, but spot zoning is something that's very difficult uh, to do and it does not encourage uh, development. I think uh, this board has been charged to help uh, uh, encourage development where we think is where, where, where you think is uh, is needed and I think that's what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, things are, going, are not going to be built right away. Things will still have to be reviewed with the neighbors and with us. And people still have a say and say, hey, what you, what you plan to put here is dangerous. And we'll look at that as we do on all projects. So I don't think this is just a license to go, uh, go crazy. I think this is just an encouragement to get things going a little further. I think this, I think, um, continue on this fabric and including uh, along Mass Ave is, is very reasonable. So I'll just leave it at that for now. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, Melissa, any additional questions for, for James? Um, no additional um, 
comments. I just, in terms of moving forward, James, I think for me, it's important for us to be very mindful of how we connect the dots to our master plan and our goals. I said that at the beginning, and that helps, I think, people understand why this makes sense. You know, when we're consolidating business districts, when we're looking at the walkability, if you're able to make that and articulate that well with our goals and all the effort that has gone on in the master plan, I think um, people will at least have the context for where this comes out because we're using the zoning as a lever to create potential for this area. And it is, it's, albeit small, I think that's important. And if we can, um, you know, explain that throughout this process, I think that'll be helpful. It's good advice, Melissa, thank you. Uh, Steve, any additional questions or, or comments for James? Um, I do have, a, well, it's a comment more about the sort of historical aspects of why our districts um, are the way they are. It, this is just a, a follow on to what Ms. Linema said, said earlier. So prior to the mid 1970s, our business districts were basically thick stripes on, um, you know, on either side of Mass Ave and on either side of Broadway. You know, these these businesses they allowed businesses, they allowed apartments, they generally allowed taller buildings. So just from a form based perspective, you know, you had um, you, you kind of had all of the activity right along the main corridors, and then it stepped back to smaller residential areas behind. Now, in the 1970s, I think, uh, I think Ms. Linem is correct in the sense that um, the zoning simply captured what was there on the ground. It's basically, if it's, if it's an apartment building, now it's an apartment zone. If it's, um, you know, this kind of business, now it's this kind of bu business district. The effect, I think, has been to freeze things in place. Um, it's probably lost us some opportunities over time because some of these sites under our current regulations are difficult to develop. Um, interestingly, one of the, you know, the characteristics of this rezoning process was that, you know, buildings that had apartments or parcels that had apartments, um, like one uh, name that's, you know, relevant to this proposal became apartment districts. Um, so if it wasn't a business, it no longer was no longer in the business district. Um, the once you have something in a residential district, it's very difficult under our current bylaw to establish any kind of business there. If you have something in, it's, that is a business district, well, it's generally fairly easy to convert it to a residential use. So, I mean, this is another, this is, I think, one of the reasons why we have had a gradual erosion of the commercial tax base over years. Um, it's just our bylaw doesn't encourage it, but it definitely allows it. Um, so, I you know, I do hope that we could take a broader, more holistic look at some point, but I do like the idea of taking, um, you know, taking targeted approaches and looking at areas where, you know, some something different may, might make obvious sense. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any other questions or comments from the board before we move to Article 43? All right, seeing none, we will move on at this time. So Article 43 is a zoning bylaw amendment related to zoning map amendment requirements, specifically around uh, the notification of abutters. Um, I, this is inserted at the request of James Fleming and 10 registered voters. I will first turn this over to uh, Kelly Linema from the Department of Planning and Community Development to, um, to top line any items that she would like to highlight from the department's memo. Actually, I see James has his hand raised. Can we take a two minute break so I can use the bathroom? Because I'm going to be here for two hours longer. Uh, sure. I think, uh, why don't we plan on 846? We can reconvene. Um, uh, let's let's go ahead and take two minutes. So that, that sounds great. Right. We'll, we'll start it again right around uh, as soon as I see you return. Thank you. Thanks.
Madam Chair. She stepped away for a moment, Steve. Oh, looks like she stepped away. Well, uh, we're, taking a, we're taking a two minute break, Steve. Sure, sure. No, I understand. I I think that was uh, appropriate that you requested that. So thank you. Actually, is Mr. Lau still on the call? I don't see him. Maybe he's also taking a break. Oh, there she is, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Steve. Yeah, just a quick question, a point of information. Um, I think it was stated earlier that the charge of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is to encourage development. Is that is that true? Uh, yes, I mean, we can get into the nuance of the, the charge of the Redevelopment Board, but um, I'm going to table that. Okay, fine, uh, fine. I, I think that's a yes. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, James, thumbs up, we're ready to go? Okay, yeah. thumbs up. Okay, so Kelly, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, for any anything that you'd like to highlight on article four, uh, excuse me, article 43 from the uh, memo that was prepared. Or, um, I can keep this brief. The section has been in Arlington zoning by law since the late seventies. Um, but just to note that changes to the zoning map do not require a butter notices under Mass General Law chapter 40A section five. Um, there are requirements about publishing notification in a newspaper for two weeks in advance of a hearing, which is what we do. Um, but there is no specific description of the abutter radius or any kind of notifications that are required for a map change. Um, this amendment basically clarifies who receives a notification of a permit. There are two other processes in town um, that are that sort of lay out the abutter radius. Um, so the, con con the Conservation Commission has an abutter radius of 100 feet for project areas. And then the Good Neighbor Agreement, which is Article 7 in the town bylaws, has a 200 foot abutter radius. Mm -hmm. And then finally, just noting that the, you know, the Department of Planning and Community Development, we follow the notification requirements of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 11, when we do our abutter notifications for any um, redevelopment board hearings so for environmental design review. But again, um, state law is not specific about abutters um, regarding map changes. So I believe this, uh, this proposed amendment is trying to seek some clarity around who is notified um, as part of a map change. Great, thank you, Kelly. Appreciate the background. Uh, James, you will have uh, up to six minutes for a presentation on this proposed article. Sure. Um, so I didn't submit any slides. Um, Jenny or Kelly, I, I had submitted a, uh, a PDF to you yesterday, or, or maybe it was earlier today. Um, I don't think did, is that able to be shown or is that not in the cards? Okay, fantastic. Um, so the main motion for this uh, bare minimum, what I want to do, the bylaw does not require me to notify the owner of a property, just the abutters, which we just talked about this, I notified someone else's property, which means in theory, I would not have to notify them, just the people around them. And that seems wrong. So that, that that's sort of what I proposed. And I think should happen at a bare minimum. Um, I wanted to par partly get your opinion on, on, the, on this as to whether this provision should even remain in the bylaw. So the PDF being shown here are the certified mail receipts that I had to file or I, the mail I had to send as part of the rezoning proposal, um, I get receipts for that and, and submit them to the as part of the petition. None of them have addresses on them. They only have zip codes. So there is no proof I actually sent them to the owners that um, that I'm supposed to in the bylaw. I mean, I can I submit a list of the people who I sent them to, and in theory you match the zip codes up, but there is no there is no actual proof, which to me seems like kind of a problem. 
Um, the other thing is that the town actually sends out notices to everyone already within, I forget what it was, I think it was like a couple hundred feet. Um, and we got one because we, we own 15 Melrose Street. Um, so we got that letter in the mail. So what I was wondering is, is there, is there a, a reason to even keep this provision in the bylaw at all, given that there is no proof that I did what I'm supposed to do and that uh, it seems like the town already does this and does a better job because they notify a larger radius around the property. Uh, that's all. Okay, great. Thank you, James. Uh, I will turn this over to Ken for uh, to start us off on the discussion or um, excuse me, any, any comments or uh, any questions for James. No, I have no, I have no comment on this one here. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm supportive of this right now, but I'd like to hear more. Okay, great. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think I would support um, what James proposes to add, which is the word owners and immediate abutters, just to clarify that uh, what the, that where the notice goes is to the owner and the immediate abutter. And I know in a way it's not technically legally necessary. The notice comes later from um, the planning department. So people end up getting noticed twice, but I think doing it just helps make sure the process works well and that people get notice ahead of when they get notice from the town. So I would um, suggest what you had put in as the, um, as the main motion, James, which is just adding the owner and immediate words to, to it. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, let's see, let's go to Melissa. Any questions for, for James or any uh, comments? No comments at this point. Great, thank you. Steve. Um, I concur with Mr. Benson. I've always read in this section of the bylaw, I've always you know, felt that immediate abutters was implied by saying about just using the word abutters. Um, and I have no objections to extending this to owners. Um, I think this is a, a fine clarification. Great, thank you. Uh, any other comments from the board before we turn this over uh, for public comment? All right, seeing none, any member of the public who would wish to speak about the proposal for Article 43, please use the raise hand function. And we'll start with Steve Moore. Oh yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'm a little confused here. Um, so what Mr. Fleming is suggesting is that addition of and for both owners and abutters to be included, not the removal of the notification requirement? That is my understanding. That's my understanding. James, if you would um, yep, just- that, 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 That's right. Just add add the owners to the list of you, because in theory, I don't have to notify the owners, right. but, but really you probably just shouldn't do that. Okay, Madam Chair, that that uh, that certainly makes sense to me as well. Um, I, I think when I was hearing uh, Ms. Lenema speak, I thought she said something effective. They follow the Massachusetts rule, which is not to I guess I was just confused. Anyway, ne never mind. I support this. It sounds very good. I thought we were talking about removing not a butter notification, and I thought that was a huge mistake. So th thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, I I, um, I agree that I think that the clarification is important, and I believe that the point with, that Kelly was making was that um, the uh, Massachusetts ruling, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, is is um, there there is no requirement specifically. Um, and so this is above and beyond what, what is required by the state. Uh, let's see, the next speaker will be Christian Klein. Thank you, uh, Christian Klein and town meeting member, uh, Precinct 10, Newport Street. I just wanted to clarify that by adding immediate to abutters, does that preclude people who are across the street who do not have a property line in common? Uh, James, would you like to answer? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when I use, so the way I use, I figure out the abutters is through the GIS tool. 
And if you look at, if you click a butters for a property, it only gives a shared property line, not across the street. So I guess this wouldn't change any of that. It would just include the owner within the number of people to notify. So um, if you if you had a corner property, it would have the two abutting properties to the left and the right, but would not have anyone else on the corner. Is that the interpretation? That is the way it I think that's the way it works right now, and this wouldn't change that. What I would um, like to do, Kelly, if you could uh, confirm if that is currently the correct interpretation. I think the interpretation varies. <laughs> so what I know what we do when we're pulling in a butter radius is we put a pin in that parcel and we we do the we do the um, the, the radius. Yeah, yeah. So if it if there is somebody across the street within that distance, then that person is captured. Um, I don't know if we if this. I, I guess this is a question for the petitioner as whether um, parcels property owners and abutters across the street would be included as abutters. If I could make a suggest, if I could just make a suggestion, James. Um, actually, I'll let Christian finish his time, and then I'll I'll come back to that to that point. Thank you, um, Mike. My concern, obviously, is that I would prefer it if um, if a butter sitter across the street um, who you know are not technically abutting abutters would have the opportunity to uh, receive notice of, of such changes as well. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and James, what I might suggest. Sorry, I'll go to Jean next because I was going to suggest <laughs> let's get a, a legal definition perhaps of immediate abutter. And well, so Jean, well, I don't not, know if that's not, what you were going to chime in with. Not, not a legal definition, but it's important to remember that this is the initial notice that goes out later. The town will send a notice to anyone within 300 feet. So those folks who are, let's say, catty corner across the street will not get notice under the current bylaw or even with James amendment if he's interpreting it correctly, but they will get notice when the town sends out the notice ahead of these meetings. So they'll get notice that there's a zoning change proposed and what it is, and they'll get notice that there's this public hearing about it. So it's not as if they don't get notice, but you don't spend a lot of money notifying people who are not immediate abutters. At least that's the way I would think about it. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, and uh, it looks like oh, Kelly has her hand up. Uh, sorry, no, Rachel, I can clarify that if this were amended, we would also only send to the immediate abutters. Um, we basically follow the text of this, although we have interpreted it as a slightly larger abutter radius than just immediate abutters. So if this were amended, then we would also send that notice to just immediate abutters. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, great. So the next uh, public speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Just a clarification on the definition of an abutter. Does this mean that it goes out to the residents of the adjacent properties or the owner of the adjacent property? Um, obviously, that it applies to like an apartment building. Um, do you notify maybe an out of town owner of the building or do you actually notify the people who live there? Thank you. James, I'll let you answer that. My understanding is that this is specifically to ensure that both are notified, correct? No, this doesn't. So, from what I understand and what I've done, is it's only the property owners who are notified currently and that. Or right now, it's the owners of the abutting properties that are notified, and this change would include the owner of whatever is actually being modified zoning wise to be included in the list. So that this doesn't change anything about interpretation. Well, shouldn't change anything about interpretation of what the its owner or renter. But from what uh, this is an email between Jenny and I, um, it was just the owners of properties that are notified. So the proposal would in, would continue that um, that current practice. I think so. If it helps, I can we can strike immediate from the from the language just to remove any clarification about what the change is. We could just say owners and abutters, 
and then whatever the interpretation is will just remain. We don't have to add any muddiness into that. I'm indifferent to that. The main, the main goal of this was either we keep it with owners in addition to whatever is done now, or we just strike it entirely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gene. Yes, I'm back again, sorry. Um, I think, I, I think um, it might be helpful for James to have at least one additional conversation with town council about this and see if it can be slightly reworded so it, it encompasses what Christian Klein mentioned, not only immediate abutters, but also properties directly across the street from the property, just to see if it's possible um, to add that. James, is that something that you'd be uh, willing to do before April 4th? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Okay, great. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak on Article 43? All right, at this time, I'll turn it over to any additional questions from board members, starting with Ken. Yeah, I'd like to hear this again later on when James gets a little more um, after this meeting with the council. Right now, I'm a little confused as far as, um, and it's, I'm easy to confuse, so James, don't worry about it, okay? It's not you. Um, I'm just a little confused what, where, where we're going from here, and I don't know what we're trying to do. Um, uh, you know, maybe... I, when I first read this, I thought I understood it, what you were trying to get at. And then after hearing today's conversation, I'm all confused again. So I, I, need, um, I need a little more clarity on this. And um, hopefully we, when we hear about, hear about this again, you know, it'll be a little clearer as far as, you know, what's what. It, it doesn't, when, when, when you're saying I could strike this or I do this or I do that, and everybody has a different opinion, I just don't know what we're trying to do here, okay? I'm sorry. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Jenny, I see you have your hand up. Welcome this evening. Thank you. Um, I, I hope this does not make things more confusing. But, but and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Jenny, since you weren't um, here during introductions, if you wouldn't mind just oh. introducing yourself for the- Not at all. Here. I'm Thank you. Jenny Raid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. So right now we have this section of the bylaw that is not a requirement by state law, 40A section five, which is, um, or section 11, which is basically our notification requirements. We follow that for everything else that we do, which requires us to notice people within 300 feet of a property, usually when there's a special permit. That's the only time that we notify people. We don't notify people of other types of zoning changes or amendments. The only notice that we do is in a, the, the legal notice in the Arlington Advocate, and of course, all of the other notifications on the website, et cetera. That's what's required under state law. This section was added to the bylaw to say that when you're doing a map amendment, you need to notify abutters, but it didn't actually say what that meant. So we've, in the very limited number of times I've interfaced with this section of the bylaw, the interpretation is we just apply the 300, the 300 foot radius, even though there's not actually any clarification of that. All it says is certified or uh, registered mail to abutters. Um, so what Mr. Fleming is trying to do is add this one circle around a property when there's a zoning amendment, a zoning map amendment specifically. Um, if you remove that section of the bylaw, there is no requirement to notify anybody of a zoning map amendment. If you slightly modify it to direct staff um, or petitioners to explain what exactly we mean by a butter, then you provide a little bit more clarity. I agree that I think consulting with the town council around what exactly would be in a butter and how to handle different types of lots makes a lot of sense. Um, but I just wanted to add that sort of nuance that we're not required to do this, but if we are required to do it, we ought to know what we're trying to actually do. So hopefully you could achieve it. Appreciate it. Uh, Jean, any additional questions or comments for James Fleming? Yes, I think it's ironic that James is just trying to clarify this. And oh, God, James. <laughs> expanding it. You know, there's, there's, there's an interesting way to think about this, and that's why I think uh, James should talk with town council, because uh, Chapter 48 of the Zoning Code 
Section 11 talks about parties of interest being abutters, meaning immediate abutters, plus people across the street, basically. So there may be a way to do this that lines it up really nicely with Section 11 of Chapter 40A. So that's why I thought James having a conversation with uh, the town council might help. Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, Melissa, any questions or final comments for James on Article 43? No comments. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Steve. Yes, um, one question for Mr. Fleming, and this is just to you know, make sure I, after all of that, I just wanna make sure my understanding is solid. Say we've got a parcel, we'll call it P, right? The current bylaw as is worded means that if you wanted to change the district designation of P, the requirement is that you send to abutters, which means all the par property owners around P, but not P itself. And your change would also send it to the owner of P. Is that is that about right? <laughs> I, uh, y yes, I don't know what the heck a butter means anymore after this interaction. All I want to do is make sure that if you're going to change the zoning, whoever you're changing it for is actually notified because it doesn't seem that that is at all required in the zone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just that some someone around the, the parcel in question must be notified. I whatever that is, just please just okay. stick stick the owner in that list for God's no, no, sake. You you just uh, you just straight you just confirmed that is what I was saying. Um, okay. I, I think Mr. Benson is right. Uh, in the well, in the in Chapter Forty Eight, there is a uh, there is a term called parties of interest, and some of the language in here would be could potentially be useful. But thank you. Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, so, James, I think you know the yeah. consensus is let's town check with, with town council, and uh, we'll we'll continue the discussion. Uh, on April 4th, unless you have something you'd like to share yeah. with us ahead of time, in which case we can get you on one of the um, agendas prior to uh, prior to April 4th. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So now let's move on to Article 41, um, which is a zoning by law amendment for apartment parking minimums. And this was also inserted at the request of James Fleming and 10 registered voters. So oh, yeah. uh, Kelly, I'll turn it uh, over to you first before to James does his presentation uh, to highlight anything you'd like to point out from the memo. Sure, thank you, Rachel. Um, so the first thing to point out is that this amendment, this proposed amendment uh, from James is actually pretty similar to what was proposed in 2019. Um, I do wanna call attention to the fact that it is only moving apartment building up into the, the residential uses for single two and three family dwellings um, and it is keeping the public housing for the elderly as it currently is in the zoning bylaw. So it's bringing parity between the parking for apartment buildings and the parking for single two and three family dwellings, which is basically one space per parking unit or <laughs> parking unit, one space per dwelling unit. Um, right now, our zoning requires um, a different calculation for apartment units, for apartment homes than it does for single two family and three family dwellings, which is like the ratio for apartments is based on the number of bedrooms and the, the ratio for um, those other types of housing is one space per dwelling unit. Um, in 2019 and then now, and now we've, and since then we've actually looked at is Arlington over part? What's the parking ratios? We've also looked at the um, MAPC right fit parking study, um, all of which have concluded that um, one space per dwelling unit is, is appropriate for the town. Um, the other thing that we did look at is the most recently approved uh, comprehensive permit for 1165 R Mass Ave did a lot of parking studies of a number of apartment dwellings in the area. Also concluded that um, the parking ratios for those, there were, there were more parking spaces available, including an overnight parking than there actually were demand. Um, so again, showing that reducing the number of apartments, um, uh, uh, reducing the number of parking space required for apartments is, is 
basically in for one unit per apartment is in line with what the demand is. Um, did want to also call attention to the fact that this is only applied to apartment dwellings, apartment buildings, which are only allowed in the R5, R6, and R7 zoning districts. They're allowed in the R4 zoning district through apartment conversions. And those apartment dwelling, those apartment buildings are really located along our key transportation corridors, which are Mass Ave and Broadway. Um, so there's a map of that in the memo. Um, and then finally, just in consistency with the master plan and the Connect Arlington, uh, the, Connect Arlington the sustainable transportation plan, um, both of those plans actually call for realigning our parking, how much parking is provided and how much parking is required with the actual demand. Um, so this, this, amend, this proposed amendment is very much in line with um, reducing the parking ratios to actually meet demand. Um, and just to note that those parking ratios requiring a minimum of one space per dwelling unit is just a minimum. So any developer, owner, or builder could provide more housing, or sorry, more parking than that, um, but just needs to provide that as a minimum. And with that, I can turn this over to James. Great, thank you, Kelly. James? Yep, um, I did have slides for this one. Great. That's me. There I am again. Uh, next slide, I guess. Cool. Um, this is just the section of the bylaw that requires um, the amount of parking per whatever kind of residential you have. So if you're a single two or three family dwelling, you need one space per unit, which seems fine. You probably build at least one or maybe more depending on how many cars you think you need. You'll just do whatever makes sense for you. Um, but apartments, for whatever reason, require uh, more than one space per unit. Um, and so uh, the thinking was, you know, is that really, is that the right amount? Is it too much? Do we, can we, do we do with less? That kind of a thing. Uh, next, please. Um, so this this is sort of what what started me down this path is that uh, most people who rent don't have more than one car, which intuitively makes sense to me. Like if you're a single guy living alone, uh, you're probably not gonna have more than one car, uh, except for one guy that I know. Um, and that uh, a, a decent chunk of renters don't have any car at all, um, which is great for congestion and you know roads, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but if you don't need a car, it doesn't really make sense for us to require parking for you. So I was thinking, well, it doesn't really make sense to me that we require more than one space per unit. If at least looking at this pie chart, the average is about one space per dwelling unit for the households we have in town. And admittedly, this is slightly old data, 2010 uh, to 2014. Um, but I'm, I assume it hasn't changed all that much since then. Uh, next, fantastic. Uh, so, so this is my neighborhood. Um, so we live in this circle. Um, it's a nice little area. Um, and uh, our need for, uh, my wife's and my need for cars is dictated by our jobs and our lifestyle. So since we're close to public transit and we have businesses in, you know, within walking distance, uh we don't need to have more than one car we it just we we tried that a couple of years ago and it just works for us uh and it's kind of nice uh next so these are a couple of apartment buildings that uh i was uh i saw on the map and circled um and doesn't like if i was thinking well if, it, if we moved into one of them it doesn't make sense that we would add we'd have more cars um we're still in the same exact spot really um the only reason we'd have so we have to get another car is if we move to a new neighborhood that isn't it doesn't have as much local stuff or isn't as walkable doesn't have as much transit uh, or if some other random circumstance changes like um, like I don't know I take a job out in New Hampshire or something like that and I have to drive to work uh, but none of those factors are influenced by the building that we live in so it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like a relevant factor uh, next fantastic thank you um, so uh, in most cases, the parking for an apartment uh, is needs to be more than one unit, um, but this would just make it one space per unit. And uh, I know that the lots of strikeout is confusing. Um, basically, it's just a way of clarifying that what is there will stay there for public housing for the elderly. So lots of strikeout and then move it over into the, the use column. Um, next. Uh, so uh, from what I remember, uh, there was a proposal last year for um, a block in my neighborhood, the old Christos Market block, um, which for actually had proposed a half space per unit, which was actually really surprising. I was like, wow, that's not a lot of parking per unit. Um, clearly, they wouldn't have proposed it if they couldn't, if it didn't break even, or at least made them a little bit of money. So that, that was sort of intriguing. 
Um, and then the old, the, uh, the building that was uh, proposed a couple of years ago and is now currently being built at the Triad block had proposed one space per unit. So it seems that people who have money and want to redevelop are willing to throw their money behind one space per unit. So I, I think you could argue that people would, it's, it's not a financial constraint to require, or, or what do I want to say? Uh, if you provide less than one, provide one space per unit, it isn't going to get in the way of you breaking even on your project. Um, next. Um, and this, this is another Warrant article um, that I looked at. Uh, I, I, got this, I got this data looking at a Warrant article from last year. Um, this is an apartment building at the end of my current street, uh, on Oxford Street near Broadway. Um, I took a look at how much uh, tax revenue you got from the different parts of the property. So there are apartments and then there's a parking lot, obviously. Um, and I looked at the, what the assessor decided it was worth. So the, it turns out the, um, the apartment spaces are valued at 80 times higher than the parking spaces, uh, which is huge. And it's like, well, that, that's, a, that's a huge amount more tax revenue from the space. So why on earth would we require parking that, you know, if it's required, sure. They were, sorry, sorry, not required. Um, if they really truly need it and they build it, then then sure. But if they don't actually need it and we're requiring it, then we're literally throwing away money that we could be using for anything, like just the streets, the schools, whatever we decide it's worth it. It's it's just an enormous gain in the tax revenue if if we're requiring parking that isn't actually needed and someone can just build more whatever on it. Um, next. Um, the other thing is I was actually able to get in touch with one of the, um, uh, the person who proposed the building from, uh, on the Christos market block. And I was able to ask them you know, roughly how much parking costs to build. So their, their estimate was, um, five to 12,000 for service parking. And it, it depended on the slope of the lot. So if you need it, if you were on a slope and you need drainage and all that other stuff, um, and that drove up the cost, but it's still in the, it's in the multiple thousands of dollars per parking space. And if you need basement parking, forget about it. It's a fortune. Um, someone's got to pay for that. I mean, it, it's, it, it gets passed on to whoever lives in it, or if it's a condo, then it gets passed on to the owner. Um, it, it, if, if it's not actually necessary, we really just shouldn't be requiring it. Um, next. Awesome. Um, so summary, uh, one space per parking, one space per dwelling unit. Um, most renters don't have more than one car. And uh, if we require it, I think we're just leaving money on the table tax-wise. Thank you. Great. Thank you, James. All right. Uh, so we'll start with Ken for any questions or comments for James on uh, the parking, um, parking minimum adjustment for apartments. Well, I want to start off with saying uh, thank you, James, for um, taking time and effort in getting uh, some of these articles together. It took up quite a bit of time and actually quite a bit of money. And uh, I really want to thank you for looking out for the interests of the town and um, saying that um, you know, it's, we're noticing that and thank you. Um, as far as this article is concerned, I am supportive of it. I believe, um, um, the way it is right now, one parking, uh, one parking space per unit in apartment buildings is more than adequate. Um, when we looked at um, some of the affordable housing projects that were, were going up, uh, where we had the opportunity to uh, reduce the, the, some of the parking requirements. Uh, I, forget, um, I forget her name, was it Barbara, Jennifer, that was presenting those projects? You know, she she, uh, she made several comments saying that her parking lot's always empty. It's not full to full capacity. So th that's a good reference to saying that you know we're overbuilding, what we're requiring overbuilding and putting an added burden onto people who are building housing, and also not leaving enough space for green space. I mean, if we had less parking spaces, we could have more open space, more green space, more trees, more grass, whatever. So i very, very supportive of this uh, article here. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Jean, any questions or comments? 
Um, I guess my only comment was I would be concerned if these were not on MBTA bus routes, since some of them are pretty easy to get to LLIFE also. And, you know, that's the way things work these days. If you are at or very close to public transit, you expect people to use public transit, and people often move to places when they're close to public transit so they don't have to drive. We've lived in our house for 31 years with only one car. And uh, one of the reasons why we moved here was it was a few blocks to the bus that went to L Life and a few blocks to Mass Ave so we could take the bus down Mass Ave too. So that's, I think, what people will look for. Um, that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, Melissa, any questions or comments for James? Um. <clears throat> Uh, no comments. I mean, I think a lot of this is supported. The high cost of free parking, you know, um, the Shoop, Shoopiece does, all the planners know that. So a lot of it is unbundling parking from your building and thinking about that and the cost. So I think this aligns with that. I think it aligns with some of the things that we have set out to do um, around, you know, figuring out how to kind of, I would say, um, look at all the costs of development and parking is up there. And I think one thing I just, you know, it's not part of this, but it's making it really explicit to folks that, you know, these apartments have limited parking. I mean, I think that you have to be able to communicate that when people are, this is not you. <laughs> this is just my comment on people who market these units when they have reduced parking. That's also part of it, but um, I support that and I support the direction this is going in. Great, thank you, Melissa. Steve, any questions or comments? I'm also supportive. I think it makes a lot of sense to make the parking requirements for on, for apartments on par with the ones that we have for single two and three family, which means there's no real, I don't see a very good reason why uh, apartments should have more. And I would just like to reiterate that this is a minimum. And, you know, if someone, you know, felt very strongly that they needed more spaces, they could always build them. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so at this time, I'll go ahead and open um, Article 41 up for public comment. Uh, Please re use the raise hand function and I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised. We'll start with Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I find myself commenting on everything tonight. Uh, I, uh, I, and I, I seem to be uh, finding myself, um, I don't know, in counter position to how what the comments I'm hearing from the board in general. Um, First, I want to say that this is old data that was in the presentation, although it was good to hear Ms. Lenema talk about perhaps there have been some other studies which are more recent than what was in this. This was a long time ago. Um, as I remember the comments about the parking lots being empty by someone had made during the uh, affordable housing developments, that those uh, observations were done, I believe, during the early part of the COVID, if I'm remembering correctly. And that certainly is not typical. Parking has been a problem in this town for as long as anyone can remember. And um, the, the desire to artificially uh, limit it, to limit cars, just isn't necessarily the outcome of limiting it. I mean, uh, the cars will appear whether or not there's a, there's a limit if people need the cars. And uh, when it comes to the desire, people saying that, well, you know, I only need one car and I live in an apartment and that's what would be probably be true for everyone. I'm not sure that's necessarily valid, particularly in many bedrooms. I think apartment dwellers aren't necessarily single. They're often two people with two separate cars. And uh, the idea that just saying, well, my experience is this and therefore I think that's what everyone's experience is going to be, I don't necessarily think um, is valid. Um, so I, one, per, one car per apartment dwelling unit as a standard, even though the apartment may have three bedrooms and be large. I know that was the intent of the original geared sort of parking ratio sizing. And, and I'm not saying that that necessarily is somebody we need to continue with per se, but maybe we need to do this incrementally in that 
when we initially offer a something smaller, 1.25 cars per apartment building or 1.15 per apartment dwelling unit and see how that goes before we jump straight to one and then have a problem that we can't undo because now everything's been built to only one and it didn't work. And now we've got too many cars on the streets or there's an issue uh, to do with, with housing and cars. I just, I think there's a couple other options than going necessarily this way. And I know that this issue is a bigger issue. As Ms. Lenema points out, it's an issue in a lot of areas of town in terms of uh, interest commissions, boards and the like have input on this. I think it requires more study than something simplistic like this approach. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Phil Goff. Yeah, thank you. My name is Phil Goff. I live at 94 Grafton Street, and I am the founder and the chair of a group called uh, Everywhere Arlington Livable Streets Coalition. And I'm speaking on behalf of the organization, not just myself for this particular um, article. And, you know, we as an organization wholeheartedly support this uh, Warren article. We think it's a good start. In fact, um, you know, many of us think that one space per unit is really too high, given that a lot of these uh, apartment buildings, especially newer ones, are going to be coming online um, along Mass Ave and mixed-use buildings potentially in the future with transit, walking, and biking opportunities. Um, until until this issue came up, to be honest, even though I've been on town meeting for a number of years, I probably should have known better, but I didn't even really realize our zoning bylaws were so suburban in many ways uh, related to required parking for uh, apartment units. You know, it's one thing for a developer to feel the need to build more parking, a higher number of parking spaces than the number of units, but it's certainly another to for the town to actually require it. So I think that you know, the overabundance of parking spaces, you know, it's three things. And um, as the proponent really uh, pointed out uh, quite well, you know, makes housing more expensive. I and mean, each space at $5,000, and that's surface parking. If it's going to be in a structure, it's going to be thirty dollars to $40,000. I mean, that's just making housing even more expensive um, in town. So I, I appreciate James uh, pointing that out. Um, each parking space is 350 square feet. That's 350 square feet of more pavement uh, and, and less, less apartment units and less green space. And we don't need more pavement in Arlington. And then I think third, you know, uh, more parking than, than a developer really wants and what a, apartment dwellers really want. It just encourages more cars. Um, and I think a lot of people that are moving, especially apartment build, uh, apartment dwellers, moving into Arlington, they're, they like the walkability, the bikeability, the transit, the Minuteman path, et cetera. And there's just really no need for the town to be requiring more spaces than a builder wants to provide. So a uh, big supporter of this, and um, I hope it uh, passes unanimously, the ARB, and then goes through town. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Stacy BG. Stacy, I'm not sure if you've gotten your audio to work again for this one. I see Adam's hand is raised. Is that to allow Stacy to speak on your computer? All right, well, I'm gonna come back to Stacy. Um, at this point, we will uh, move to Jennifer Seuss. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have to say, when I've watched meetings where the builder says, I am building more parking than I need, but I don't want to go through the process of trying to get a reduction because it's just too much extra work, extra time, extra expense. Um, I find that very tragic. Uh, so we have, so then we have a building that's more expensive, where obviously a developer, a builder has to charge more to recoup those expenses. We have impermeable land, you know, we have extra like paving where we could have something permeable like grass and bushes and so forth. Um, and it just strikes me as, as sort of 
sad, <laughs> really just very, very um, frustrating that our zoning requires people to build things more than they than they need. Now, I do think this is a fairly conservative proposal, and I think it is likely that if a building is very close to uh, the 77 or close to the red line, that there still will be more parking than we need. Um, but so it's an incremental approach. Um, but I think it's worth considering, you know, doing this slowly and creating parity with the single and two family um, houses that we have in town, the requirements there. Um, and honestly, I think several years later, we might want to reduce it further, reduce the requirement further. That doesn't mean that it, a builder has to keep to the minimum. If you ever, if they ever felt their project needed more parking, they would build more parking. But, um, but I feel that this is a sort of a careful, modest proposal um, that's worth considering. So I urge you to support it. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to Stacy BG. See if your audio is working yet. Okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, Adam Dessenberry. Adam? I'm asking them to unmute, but um, seems not to be working. Okay, uh, so we'll go ahead and continue moving on. We'll move on to um, Alex Bagnall. Hi, Alex Bagnall, Wyman Street. Uh, let's, let's face it, requiring more parking for apartment buildings is one tool to discourage multifamily housing, makes it more expensive and harder to fit on the lots. It's a classic exclusionary move. There is no good rationale for treating apartments differently from one and two family homes with regard to parking. What does it get us? Uh, small apartment buildings, large parking lots. Do we really need to require the construction of so much typically impermeable surfaces to store our most significant carbon emitters? We should be using public policy and zoning to promote walking, biking, and the use of public transit not more automobile usage. Our inflating parking minimums run contrary to just about every environmental goal this town has ever expressed. And I am delighted that you uh, all seem inclined to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Seuss, I'm not sure if you're still here with us, but if you are, I neglected to remind you to, uh, when you introduce yourself, add your address. If you wouldn't mind just stating that for the record, I'd appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I'm off about that, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Teal Street, 45 Teal Street. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Uh, let's see, so we'll now go to Eileen Cahill. Eileen Cahill, great. Um, hi, yes, I just wanted to um, you to consider- I'm there sorry. Was a person could you just you introduce hear? yourself first, last name and address uh, for the record when we start? Sure, Eileen K. Hill Dixon F. Um, I think it might be a bit optimistic that you're saying that, you know, a, a, what would have been a parking space because it would fit the requirement would be green open space. I think one of the commenters said that um, that would be great if that were the case. I don't think that's realistic. I think it's more you have to you have to look at this um, from the point of the designer, the developer. What they want to do is get as many units in as they possibly can. So if now they don't have a restriction on parking, you're going to have um, you know they're they're just looking out to get make more money on their project. So. I agree with uh, one of the commenters that it, it, this seems kind of like in a um, based on the presentation, based on like uh, you know this person James's um, like lifestyle, you know, or, or or his one experience in life as you know him and his spouse. Um, it didn't seem very technical at all. It didn't seem very um, objective. It, so it, I I don't really know how the board is like in support of it so quickly. And I'm just questioning it. it. It it seems like you need to take a step back and really think about all the repercussions, uh, just to make sure. Because I, I, you know, like I said, it would be lovely if what would be 
a required parking space would be turned into green space, but I really doubt that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Thomas Allor. Uh, yes, um, I agree with uh, Ms. K. Hill and everything she said. I think she makes some excellent points, and I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Scott Mullen. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? I can, thank you. Oh, thank you. Scott Mullen, 68 Henderson Street, uh, where I live with uh, two, we have two adults, one first grader and a dog, uh, six bikes and one car, which we park uh, in uh, a space for four cars because that's how this little cottage was built uh, many, many years ago in Hendersonville. Um, look, this is a, a, a great uh, conversation. Thank you for even considering this. Uh, I mean, uh, I want to support the board that seems inclined to support this measure. Again, this is a minimum. We're lowering a minimum. We're not imposing a maximum. We're not, we're not mandating anything. We're giving flexibility uh, to developers that are gonna build here. And I, I do wanna thank James for putting together a great presentation. For those who haven't read the MAPC report, the parking study, uh, it's really, it's a great read. We've gotta add data to this. Parking's an emotional thing. Um, uh, but it doesn't need to be. There's data here, uh, and we, we, we all might live different ways, but we can all uh, live in the same town. So thank you for this, and please advance this to town meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try one more time. Um, let's see. We have uh, Adam uh, Dutzenberry. Hi, it's Stacey. Actually, can you hear me now this time? We can hear you now. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Because like I say, technology doesn't really just like me for some reason, particularly tonight. Um, so anyway. Um, I'm sorry. First, last name. You can give me to repeat my address again. Of course. Oh, yes. Yeah. Stacey Bukovals, General Office, 8 Marathon Street. I just actually had a curiosity question um, because the house I live in is actually, it's a two family. It's been in my family for like about 70 years. And so we've had tenants over the years downstairs and like half the time. Um, they've definitely had more than one car. So I'm just curious where you got that um, that information came from that most people, most tenants only have one car. I mean, is there even, a, do you guys have a way to tell which houses and apartments in town are occupied by owners versus tenants and then conduct a survey? Or is that just an assumption based among the person, among your own reference group? Just a curious right. awesome question, like I said. So thank you for allowing yeah. me to ask it. Great, thank you. Um, I'll turn that over to James and Kelly who cited, uh, data um, from a, a few different sources. So James, if you could cite your sources, sure. that would be fantastic. Sure, so the source for this data is the American Community Survey, and they were able to break out the data into renting households and households that were um, uh, owner-occupied. So you, they had, this is just the renting one. Um, they also have the data for the people who own their households and how many cars they own. Um, I didn't show that one just because it, it didn't seem relevant. Um, so for rent for the renting households, they found that um, uh, about half renter half of renters had exactly one car per household, what they classified as a household, and then about twenty five percent had zero cars, and slightly less than twenty five percent had two cars, and then there was some minority that had um, uh, three or more cars. Thank you, James. And I can just point out, so we, we refer to a couple of parking studies in the staff memo. So the first one is the MAPC Perfect Fit Parking Initiative that was done in 2019. And they studied um, overnight parking counts in uh, 14 communities. Arlington was one of them. And Arlington um, had an average of 0 0.73 parked cars per household overnight. Um, there were multiple locations that were studied as part of that. And it's, it's a very thorough report. Um, the second was looking at reporting from 2019 that looked at um, Arlington 360, 30 to 50 Mill Street, 438 Mass Ave, a number of other properties and looked at the parking, parking utilization rates for those, um, none of which were over one space per unit. And then we also looked at, um, there was uh, there were multiple parking studies done for as part of the proposal for 1165 R Mass Ave, um, and those parking studies were done at various points, recognizing that parking may have shifted throughout the pandemic. So I believe they were done in 2020 and 2021, um, just to kind of get a measure and and really just check the accuracy of those. And those parking studies were done both by the developer team, as well as our um, town's um, our town's development review consultant. So we just had those verified by independent consultants. Great, thank you very much. 
All right, uh, let's see, any other members of the public wishing to speak? Uh, Steve, we've, you've already had an opportunity to speak on this one, so I'm actually going to, to move on. Um, and I'll uh, end public comment period for, for this particular article um, and move it back to the board. So any uh, final um, questions or comments for James on Article 41, starting with uh, Ken? No. Jean? Um, no. All right, Melissa? No. And uh, Steve? Uh, briefly, I um, I agree with the earlier comment that this is a fairly incremental approach. Um, I mean, personal transportation is a significant source of is a significant greenhouse gas emitter, and I know cars are very close and it's you know very part of our our culture. But um, you know, I think that addressing greenhouse gas emissions and climate change will be we're going to be talking about these a lot more in years to come. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, James, for Article 41. Uh, we'll now move on to Article 42, which is a zoning by law amendment related to open space uses. This was also inserted at the request of James Fleming and 10 registered voters. Uh, we'll turn this over first to uh, Kelly uh, Linema for an overview of the memo from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Rachel, um, this is really, you know, in response to James's proposed amendment, we just, took a look back at what the Economic Development Recovery Task Force had worked on throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, they had worked with the select board in order to relax the requirements regarding temporary uses and activities in Arlington's parks and open spaces. Um, looking at this amendment, it seems like it proposes to allow for those temporary uses to be codified in the zoning bylaw um, and allow them to be used temporarily for both arts, um, culture, profit and non-for-profit and for-profit uses. Um, and it basically, yeah, it basically takes that temporary relief and codifies it. Um, and the, it basically, it builds on the work of the Econo Economic Development Recovery Task Force, which is in support of those types of uses. Great, thank you, Kelly. Uh, James, I'll turn it over to you for uh, six minutes. Again, if you could, I know you've done it several times, introduce yep. yourself first, last an address, yep. and then James, jump in your presentation. I will say it's, it's both a blessing and a curse that all of my articles are on the same night. Um, uh, ne <laughs> next slide, please. Um, so, so this is, um, uh, first of all, thanks to Paul Sprague for his pictures of uh, the beer garden at Arlington Center from 2018 and 2019, um, where the town allowed the use of Woodmore Park for the event. I, I remember going to the first one, it was really fun. Um, this is from what Bob Bob's reporting, there was like a thousand people at the first one in 2018 and then 600 in 2019. Uh, it, 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 I, I can't imagine this wasn't a success by any measure. Uh, local restaurants selling food, uh, local musicians playing and people just enjoying themselves. It was great. Um, this is a really good example of the town using its public space to create a fun place to live and local businesses get to be supported as well. Next. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, this comes out of a conversation I had back in September with um, town council and uh, Joe Connolly, who's the Parks and Rec director. Um, they looked to this section of the zoning bylaw to figure out what is allowed to happen in the open space district, basically the parks. Um, this so basically by the current ruling, you can only have a food or beverage concession, whatever, by a special permit. Um, and you can't do anything for profit um, is what their interpretation is. And so what this uh, motion would do is it would allow things for profit like um, fitness classes, which is why there's a line in here for outdoor recreation since they were, fitness businesses were particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Um, and then similar for um, uh, cultural arts, Shakespeare in the Park kind of performances, rehearsals, that kind of thing. That just seems like kind of like a fun thing to have and and uh, I'd like to see that next. Um, so uh, the reason this slide is in here is that in the previous table there are a couple entries by special permit, um, which I thought was strange because they're not given by Parks and Rec. They're zoning authority um, permits, and it takes about two months to get through a process to have it. By which point, frankly, your event that you were planning is probably 
not relevant anymore. Um, it seems like an unreasonable burden for someone trying to do something temporary in town. Like you still, according to Joe, at least, you, no matter what, you have to go through parks, but having this requirement in here just doesn't really seem to make sense. Um, this apparently wasn't a problem for the beer garden that happened in 2018, 2019, because Whittemore Park is under the control of the select board who can just vote to allow it. Um, yes, fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, this is another section of the, not, not the zoning bylaw, but the town bylaws. Um, uh, so by removing that special permit requirement, it doesn't mean those events are not regulated. Um, we still can't have alcohol or undue noise without um, the town allowing it. You can't have advertising without Parks Department. And I, I actually, I showed Joe Connolly this exact main motion, and I asked him if it would, if there was any reason the Parks Department wouldn't allow, or sorry, not allow, they wouldn't be able to determine what could happen in the park and what the rules would be. And he said, no, basically, no matter what, the Parks Department gets the final say over what does and doesn't happen and what the rules are. So uh, I think changing this doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Uh, in summary, uh, I would like more fun things to happen in our business, in our uh, park space. And I think it'd be great if, God forbid, we ever have a pandemic again, businesses could use the park. Uh, or you could just have performances, you know, on a semi-regular cadence for fun, sell tickets, that kind of thing. That seems okay. Um, and that even with this change, uh, we don't lose control of our parks. The parks department so does to decide, you know, when and where and how something happens. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, James. Uh, I'll now turn it over to members of the board for any questions or comments, starting with Ken. No, I have no comments on this. I'm generally supportive of, of this. Great. Thank you, Ken. Gene? Yeah, I just have a question. I don't know if it's for Jenny or Kelly or um, James. I. I I'll start by saying I think it's sort of strange that people have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals to get a special permit to use a park. You know, that's usually not what zoning is for. But I just want to make sure that if we delete the special permit requirements, that there's still going to be somewhere in town where they will have to go to get approval to do an event in one of the open spaces. So James, I'll, I'll um, send that over to you since it sounds sure. like you had spoken with uh, yep. the, uh, the Parks Department about that. Yep, yeah, so so I, I had thought of this and I actually asked, I sent this main motion over to Joe Conley and I'd asked him, you know, if we allowed these things, would, would Parks Department lose control over what happens in the parks? And he said no. Basically that there wouldn't be a circumstance where they wouldn't have the ability to issue not a, not a special permit zoning wise, but they still have to allow whatever it is explicitly and they get to set the conditions and things like that for what the rules and event has to abide by. Thanks. And, and for um, Jenny or Kelly, are there any open spaces in town that are not controlled by the Park and Recreation Department, but by some other part of town? Jenny? Yeah, the Whittemore Park, for example, is under the authority of the select board. Um, and then there are some spaces under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. But typically the types of activities that we're talking about happen in the, the, the open space district, which is mostly the Parks and Rec Commission. And they have their own process for permitting, which is what uh, Mr. Fleming was talking about. Um, so that would not be removed. And the special permit granting authority is the redevelopment board, not the zoning board of appeals. Sorry. So the... Um... The Robbins Garden between the town hall and the library is who would give out a permit for that? The select board. And the same with Whittemore Park, the select board. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But the, um, those are among the many types of uh, open spaces where pandemic related exercise and entertainment types of activities and events were happening during the pandemic. So. It was a mixture of different uh, types of open spaces. So if we do what Mr. Fleming suggested, there's going to be no open space in town where people can just show up without having to get permission from somewhere in town. You would still need permission okay, from thanks. one of those jurisdictions in order to have to do the things that are outlined um, in the zoning bylaw, including the additions that Mr. Fleming is uh, suggesting. 
Okay, thanks so much. That's it. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Thanks. Um, no, I don't have any questions. It seems pretty clear that, you know, this is kind of removing one of the obstacles. There's still oversight and control on kind of in terms of whether it's the Board of Selectmen or the Parks and Rec Board, if I understand this correctly, depending on the location and the type of use. So I am, I am good. Great. Thank you. Steve? Uh, nothing for me, Madam Chair. Uh, so at this time, we'll open this up to any uh, questions or comments from the public, and we will uh, start with Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to wait for it. Strongly support this particular motion on the part of Mr. Fleming. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I um, no, I only wanted to, uh, to say the reason I raised my hand on the last question was I wanted to thank Ms. Lanima for having brought up that parking detail that was important to hear, important to know, and filled out my ignorance on the matter. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to, uh, to speak on uh, the open space article? Right, seeing none, uh, we will uh, throw this back to the board for any final questions or comments on Article 42. I'll just run through our roll call. Ken? Nope. Jean? No comments. Melissa? No further comment. Steve? Uh, the pandemic reminded us that it's fun to be outside. <laughs> Nothing further. <laughs> here, here. All right. Um, so with that, we will move on from Article 42. Uh, to Article 40, uh, excuse me, 44, 44. 44 uh, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for restaurant uses inserted at the request of James Fleming and 10 registered users. Um, I will first turn this over to Kelly uh, Linema to highlight any items from the memo uh, that she'd like to mention for the board. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Steve, for the kind note. That was very nice. Um, so, in response to um, James Fleming's proposed article, we just basically took a look at restaurant uses in town right now, um, what's allowed by right in the business zoning districts, um, which both a restaurant and bank uses in those zoning districts currently have a 2,000 square foot threshold above which you have to go through the environmental design review permitting process in order to receive a special permit um, in order to open a business. We also noted that um, small professional business medical offices have a slightly large, a higher threshold. Um, and fast order, fast order food restaurants have a lower threshold. So um, there's basically just kind of like a different, different set of thresholds in the B2, B2, B2A, B3, and B5 zoning districts. Um, what we did note about restaurants is that there are a lot of additional permitting processes that are required for, for restaurants. Um, so you have to go through a process with Health and Human Services, you have to go through a process with Inspectional Services Department, um, and then you also have to go through a process with the Select Board. So those three processes together create a lot of different hurdles for a restaurant that don't exist for other businesses in town. Um, and on top of that, if you are looking to obtain a beer and wine license or an all alcohol license, um, do outdoor sidewalk, cafe, dining, et cetera, there's additional processes for those. So I think we just wanted to look at what are the barriers to opening a restaurant in Arlington and how do those compare to other uses? We found that there are additional barriers for restaurants. Uh, we did also look at um, restaurants that have opened in the last decade in Arlington. This is not a comprehensive list that's included in the memo. Um, but one of the things that we noted is that restaurants either seem to be very large <laughs> or they seem to be very, very small. And um, now we don't know if that's a function of um, the overall square footage of space that's available in some of our vacant storefronts. Um, but what did seem interesting to me or perhaps for the board to consider is whether um, whether what's absent, which are those those restaurants that are between the 2,000 and 4,000 square feet, if, if their absence is as a result of that additional permitting threshold. Um, so that's something for the board to consider and maybe James has additional information on them. Um, 
And that is uh, pretty much over. Well, I guess in addition, uh, we did provide some background information on whether there was a special permit required to open. And I think the one thing to note is that the Heights Pub at 1314 Mass Ave, which basically is in that two to 4,000 square foot um, threshold, actually had to go through two special permit processes, one through the CBA and then one through the ARB, um, which is uh, adds a lot of time and cost for a restaurant to open. And so with that, I will pass this over to James. Great, James, if you wanted to start your presentation, that would be great. Yep, sorry, uh, if my camera dies uh, during this, then uh, I sincerely apologize. Uh, James Sloan, 58 Oxford Street, hopefully for the final time tonight. Next. Uh, so, uh, so this, uh, sad to say, <laughs> this was common ground, uh, they closed recently. Um, since the building was built before the current zoning by lot, um, so when they opened the restaurant, uh, they had a point of contention, which that there wasn't enough parking. Um, and the only tool that they had to open was the special permit, um, which are a tool that lets you kind of regulate uses that are allowed, but where the, the impact of the business is a perceived threat to the town or those who live nearby. Um, so, uh, I started looking at, um, uh, basically like what is this special permit require of them where does it apply and and you know is it actually truly necessary uh, next um so th so this is sort of the first place i went to was the section of the zoning bylaw for um for uh, uh uses for restaurants um the important point here is that if you have a restaurant uh i'm ignoring fast order food um for the purposes of this article um if you're under 2000 square feet you can basically do anything by right. Um, you only go through like a signage review. Uh, and if you're over that threshold, then you go through a special permit, basically, no matter where you go, um, which kind of makes sense to me. Like, like, if you're a small restaurant, you can't afford the process. Uh, if you're bigger, you're more likely to be able to afford going through that process. So like that, that distinction kind of like it has a, a satisfaction in my mind. Um, next. Um, the proposal for me is to uh, increase the threshold for that that um, that distinction where you need a special permit and where you don't from two to four thousand square feet. Um, for context, common ground was fifty three hundred, so they're they're well into the special permit territory even with the um, the change. And then um, like sort of like like a one that I found that was like kind of straddling the line was not your average Joe's. So like something like roughly that size, slightly smaller, is like the most you could have without a special permit. And then the Heights Pub is something that currently, like, just barely isn't allowed by the current ruling uh, without a special permit, but that with this change, it would be allowed. Next. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I, thankfully, I got some help from uh, uh, Steve Revelak on the board, um, who actually was able to tell me sort of what the process is for a special permit, just in general, in detail. So it's like oh, there's a legal notice that goes out. You advertise for a couple of weeks. You've got public hearings. You've got as many as you, as many of those as you need. You get changes um, from the town that asks for it. There's an appeals period afterwards. Um, but like it, like if everything goes smoothly, it takes like two months, um, which is that's a lot. Um, and the town has a pretty wide latitude to ask for whatever uh, changes they think are necessary. Uh, next, so I I got unbelievably lucky and found the special permit for common ground and was able to find all of the uh, things that they needed to do. So um, as part of this process, they were asked to reduce their seating. They had to have a dedicated section on their website showing where they need, where people would park in the neighbor, in the area. Um, they had to sound through parts of the restaurant. They had restrictions on live music and it just, it just kind of felt like it went on and on and on. And that in the, in the Arlington advocate that, that reported the approval of the board, the owner said that he couldn't continue to, to go to the board and add like, like negotiate changes at each appearance cost him $10,000. That's like, if, if the town is trying to negotiate the something like a size of a grocery store or an obnoxious development, that seems like a useful tool. But in the case of common ground, it kind of feels like an unnecessary deterrent. It doesn't, it's not one that I want our town to have unless it's really, really necessary. That's a lot of money for someone to go through. Next. Um, it also, the, the thing with special, with special permits is that it, 
it only applies to the one restaurant, not to a, like two side by side. So this is an example of um, things that are and aren't allowed by special permit. So on the right, you have two restaurants that are each 1500 square feet. Both of those can go in, no special permit. The one on the left, 3000 square feet, it needs a special permit. In terms of impact to the neighborhood, it doesn't seem like there would be a huge difference between the two. Maybe like a little bit more for a 3000 square foot restaurant, but like this is what we're being protected from sort of a thing by the special permit. And it doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem worth it to ask a business to go through that process, um, just in general. Next. Um, we also know that the, the town wants restaurants. They actually filed a warrant article to encourage active uses. Um, and every survey that I've ever seen and participated in, uh, the results have always been that residents want more restaurants. So uh i think we should probably allow more of them if we can uh there's a current list of uh current current vacancies on the town website i mean I this is a couple months old at this point um there are three current vacancies that couldn't become restaurants right now the retailer office um and if they didn't they couldn't do it without going through that special permit process and there are a total of over 500 properties in the business district in general a lot of those are probably not restaurants and some percentage of them probably couldn't couldn't change to a restaurant without going through this process and if we really want to encourage more restaurants i think it would be a good step to just make it easier next uh in summary uh for restaurants 4,000 square up to 4,000 square feet would not require a special permit i think from what i've seen in the reporting and the record that it can be a burden for restaurants over 2,000 square feet and that if we were to change it, I think there would be a decent amount of opportunity for new restaurants. But that's all I'll say. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, James. Uh, I'll now turn it over to the members of the board for um, questions and comments, starting with Ken. Well, James, you bring up a, <clears throat> a good point here. Uh, I, I think the way the current zoning is set up is for the small mom and pop stores, like pizza stores or a little sub shop and that kind of stuff, that's under 2000 square feet. And then for the larger chain stores, they can afford that because they have, you know, it's larger, but there's no mid range um, restaurants that, um, that, this, that, that can uh, afford the cost. And also, um, uh, I, I, you know, I tend to, I tend to agree with you with this. Uh, I think we wouldn't mind having a few more higher end restaurants that have some seating where you can go somewhere and sit and eat. And, uh, and I think that those, those are the 4,000 square foot uh, restaurants, not the 2,000 square foot restaurants. And I think a, um, there's a lack of it. When you did a, did you do it? Actually, took a quick survey of all the restaurants that we have in Arlington and what the square footage for each ones are. Rachel, should I? Answer? Yeah, James. I'm sorry. Yes, if you if you could answer, oh, okay. that would be great. Uh, sorry, I, no, I appreciate and, you checking. Thank yep, and, and my camera has died, so you'll have to stare at something that says ES Webcam Utility Beta for a little while. Um, so the answer is that I didn't do a survey and the reason is partly just practical um, because so many buildings are carved up into multiple storefronts and they don't show up in any of the property records. I didn't know how to do a survey of square footage for restaurants. Uh, Jenny, would you have any idea or uh, something on that that could help us understand um, the number of restaurants? Kelly, it's ready yeah. to answer. Yep. Um, I, I actually don't have a definitive number right now. I'm trying to open the spreadsheet from our intern, but um, it, what we did do is also look at uh, common victualler licenses to try to get a sense for, because that's one of the permits that you have to receive. Um, although we just went back through, I think, um, like 2018 on that because uh, restaurants do change over um, quite a bit, but we could we could look to, um, I, I know we had someone studying this, so I could get a little more information for you in the future. Thank you. I have no more questions, Rachel. Great. Thank you, Ken. Jean? I have a few questions, and then I want to point out what I think is an anomaly with Jane's proposal. But let me start with the questions. You know, in before times, meaning 
before the pandemic, um, there were many more restaurants in Arlington and Arlington was a restaurant destination for many people from out of town. So what I'm not really understanding, James, is with the current rules in place, we managed to have all of those restaurants in town. So why do we need this now when we didn't need it before the pandemic? James, do you want to address Jean's question? Sure, and again, sorry, my camera is not working. It's okay. Uh, I guess I would say we probably did need this before the pandemic, um, that the owner of the common ground, basically it's, I know it's a strong word. It feels like they kind of capitulated to the board at the time because they couldn't afford to keep coming back and negotiating that they had wanted a function room with live music, but that they weren't able to do so because the board wasn't inclined. Um, like what we can debate whether that's the right thing for the town, but that doesn't seem like a healthy relationship for the town to have with this business community. So I, I mean, I wasn't on the board then, but when you showed your slide of the things that the board asked for, like soundproofing, you know, where people should park, those all seem like reasonable things to me. And if we didn't have any way to have the restaurant come in, I'm not clear who says to them, soundproofing, put on your website where people can park and, and you know, I haven't looked at the permit, but some of the other things in the permit. So I think there's a balance here. And the question is, where does one strike the balance? And I think as the restaurants get bigger, then they tend to have more impact. And at some point in the past, the decision was made 2000 square feet. When we had this conversation, when you came to us a month or two ago to talk about doing this, there was some acknowledgement that when you were above 2000 square feet, you'd have enough patrons, enough seating, et cetera, et cetera, where the um, redevelopment board would need some level of control in terms of telling the restaurants what they could and should and could not do um, at the place. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that 2,000 square feet was the right place, but I think it's less likely that 4,000 square feet is the right place um, for this, just considering history in town, size, size of the restaurants we've had in town, the fact that we've had a lot of really nice restaurants in town um, before the pandemic. So I wanna hear what other people have to say about this. I will also say that if we had something for site plan review rather than special permit, I think that would be something to consider as an alternative, but we don't have a site plan review option. So it's special permit or not. So the other thing I wanna mention is if whomever is showing the slides, if you could put up the slide where James is showing the proposed change you, he wants to make to the chart, this is the thing that I think we need to fix up. There we go. No, no, the new one. Uh oh, did I not? I don't think I included the proposed change in the slide. Uh, uh, I think it was just in text, not in the table. Okay, so so let me yeah, so let me say what I think you've done that I don't think you intend to do. Um, so. Currently, um, a restaurant of less than 2,000 square feet gross floor air is not allowed at all in the B4 zone. More than 2,000 square feet is allowed with a few other things with a special permit. But what you've proposed to do is to raise that to 4,000 square feet. So right now, a restaurant of more than 2,000 square feet in the B4 zone could come in with a special permit. But the way you've redone this, it would have to be 4,000 square feet. So you're basically prohibiting a restaurant between 2,000 and 4,000 square feet, which can now be done with a special permit from being in the, in the B4 zone. 
and requiring it to be 4,000 square feet. I don't think that's your intention. Oh, but that's yeah, what yep, you are, you're absolutely correct. That and was not at all the intention. So you would need to fix, you'd need to fix this up in any event um, to get your intention right. But the, yeah, those are my comments and concerns about this. Great, thank you, Dean. I appreciate you bringing that point up for James. Uh, let's see, can I see you have your hand up? Yeah, I just want to comment uh, a little bit on what Jean said. Uh, I was on the board at the time that Common Grounds was um, approved, and I don't believe, from, from my memory, that we were that um, demanding. Uh, the only thing we were uh, a little bit adamant on was just the function room of, of a big music room down there, and we just said it needs precautions if you were going to do that. And I think that I would have said that if it was anything. And I don't think my opinion would change on that whatsoever. So I think that was a good thing. I'll just leave it at Great. that. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Melissa, any questions or comments for James? Um, no, I mean, in general, I think this is a supportive action for the local businesses as I see it. From my experience, you know, in economic development, um, these regulatory hurdles create difficulties for the smaller business and 4,000 square feet would qualify as that, you know, looking at areas where they have the corporate type of Darden type restaurant, those are much larger in size and seating. Um, so looking at this, I mean, with the adjustment that Jean made, I think that was a great catch um, that, you know, I'm, you know, this is in the direction that most of what you know I hear from Arlington residents in terms of supporting independent businesses, um, this would be in line with. Great, thank you, Melissa. Steve. Yeah, I'm generally supportive as well. Um, one thing I that did catch my attention in the memo was you know, just the observation that between 2,000 and 4,000 square feet, there's very well. There's the Heights Pub. There's one rest. There's one uh, one establishment. And I mean, it's not immediately apparent why that is. I mean, it could be, you know, at 4,000 square feet is, it, it, it could be opportunity loss, although I have no, you know, solid feeling that it is. It's, you know, could also be an interesting coincidence. But at any rate, I, I, do, um, I do think this is a good direction to go in. Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to any members of the public who uh, would like to provide any uh, questions or comments for uh, proposed Article 44. All right, seeing no raised hands, I will uh, turn this back to the board for any final questions uh, for James, starting with Ken. Nope. Jean? None. No. Uh, Melissa? Did we lose Melissa? I'm going to take that as a no. No, no okay. I'm, I have to move locations. Sorry. Okay. No problem. And Steve? Nothing further, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, so, James, thank you very much. Um, as Ken mentioned earlier, I think we all want to echo um, our thanks to you for um, all of your hard work and thoughtfulness in bringing all of these uh, potential warrant articles for discussion, not only to the board, but to all the members of the public who joined us this evening and all of those people who have um, written in and, and commented and, and will be continue to be part of this process through town meeting. So thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you. All right. We'll see you on April 4th. Uh, so at this point, um, I'd uh, like to see if someone uh, could motion to continue the Warren Article public hearings to our next meeting, uh, which is on March 21st. So motioned. I'll second that motion. All right, we'll take a roll call vote starting with Ken. Yes. Uh, Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. <coughs> Steve? Yes. And I have a yes as well. Thank you. That closes agenda item number one.
And we will now move to uh, agenda item number two, which is uh, regarding a special town meeting and um, two potential zoning warrant articles. Um, and uh, Kelly, I'm not sure whether you or Jenny would like to speak to these articles and the way that this special town meeting following or in, in the midst of, of our planned town meeting um, would, uh, would, would be proposed to move forward. So Jenny, I see you took yourself off mute. Yes, um, Kelly is going to bring up the memo just so I can walk through it. Great, thank you. Um, yes, I'm sorry to say that we came up with some more potential zoning warrant articles and have an opportunity to address them at a special town meeting. Um, the special town meeting is likely to occur May 9th or 11th. Is that correct, Kelly? Yes. Um, so we have time to think about, we would probably have to add a night, I think in April, Kelly, <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, so there, I'm not there, looking at the document. No, no, um, there, there are basically two options. You want me just to talk through the alternatives real quick? Um, if you don't mind, just yeah, because that, I think that's relevant to, you know, whether or not uh, we'll be able to, to move sure. these forward and have the discussion. Yeah, so either, so the first option is a little bit faster paced schedule. Um, we would need to get the legal notice in by this Thursday so that it could be properly noticed on the 24th and the, and, um, the 31st. And then on the 7th, the, the special hearing that we have on the 7th to review for the book, for the board to vote and approve the report to town meeting, we could then have a hearing for these three articles. The second hearing, which is already scheduled with the board on the 25th, um, could include a vote on, on these three these three proposed amendments. So that's option one. Option two would be to postpone the legal notice until the 24th, have that published on the 31st and the 7th, and then hold a hearing, a special hearing, which is not currently scheduled, perhaps the week of the 19th, um, which I know is school vacation week, so that may be a bit of a hurdle, but um, that's our second option. And then we would still have that vote on the 25th. And both of these would get all of the required hearings and legal notices, et cetera, in before um, a special town meeting on either the 9th or the 11th. Great, thank you for laying that out for us. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so now I'll just run through the three. Well, I can, we can talk about them one at a time or what would what would you prefer? What would, I, what's the preference? Um, why don't we uh, run through them one at a time and I'll just take any, any questions. I think that's probably easiest. Okay, so for the first time in my own time working for the town, we received a call from the clerk's office regarding um, when somebody is getting a certificate for their, uh, to open up a family childcare, um, that they did not comply with zoning and they needed to get a special permit. So it's opened up a process that I, uh, I think is quite a burden. And in fact, dealing with these particular providers appears to be quite a, a significant burden, including one of them so will eventually get to this at a different meeting, but will, um, is, would like to request a waiver for the cost of the permit fee. Um, and I, I think, we had the conversation about, um, you know, when we when we went to um, amending the bylaws part of our codification, we had a lot of conversation about sort of the Dover the Dover Amendment and sort of the exempt uses. Um, family child care is not does not fall into that category, so it's not obviously one of them. But I think if we had looked a little bit more carefully at other types of child care uses, we might have had more of a discussion about it. So. Regrettably, we, we did not, and here we are now. Um, and I, I wanted to just sort of outline for you the different types of licensed family child care programs. Some of you may have had your own children in one of these programs. It's a very small uh, program that happens out of somebody's home um, with a, a small number of children, uh, usually a combination of infants and older children up to age four or five. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a great opportunity to have basically have your children close to home or in a home uh, daycare kind of setting rather than in a more of a childcare facility. But um, 
going through a special permitting process for this use, I think is a high bar. And so my recommendation is to, con is to turn it into a Y use um, and allow that by right. So the article is to amend um, those various tables that we have related to the use regulations um, in each one of the categories. So 5.4.3, 5.5.3, and 5.6.3 would all be amended to allow ch family child care as an allowable use by right. And that is it. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, I'll run through and see if anyone has any questions or comments for Jenny on this first proposed article, starting with Ken. Yeah, um, the family child care, how many, how many kids are, 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 is part of that? Is it six or is it 10 or is it all of that? If there's three, three options, Jenny just highlighted them up to six, up to eight and up to 10. Okay. I, I, I think, um, having a, um, a special permit for the latter two may be a, a requirement. I mean, I just don't see some all of a sudden opening up a family child care and having 10 kids running around uh, their their house. It, it is it will affect the neighbors quite a bit uh, with just some of the requirements for that and also the pick up and drop off for all those kids. I mean, if it's a six kids, I think that's that's fi that's fine. That's maybe like a, you know, a large family. But once you start getting higher, it's going to be a, a little different. It's that it won't be. I don't see it as a family uh, child care anymore. That's. I like to see what what the other board members think. But that that's my initial thought. All right. Thank you, Ken. Jean. I I was yeah, Jenny. It was helpful for you to sort of walk through this because I've been sort of trying to figure out exactly what this would mean. Um, and I think, well, let me ask this. Is this what's considered a home occupation under the current zoning bylaw? Not defined in our current bylaw, family well, child care. I'd say, I'd say it might be considered a home occupation although I don't think that's defined in the zoning bylaw. Um, and if you look at home occupation, which I'm doing it, which I was doing until I dropped the page, it's um, allowed by special permit in all the residential districts at least, but it's subject to home occupation in 5.9.1, which has a number of criteria. Um, that they have to meet. And I think maybe it would be considered a home occupation um, because it mentions pupils in the use tables. So I'm not opposed to doing what you're suggesting, but um, I think maybe if what you're suggesting is to put another line in the use table for each of the districts that say, a licensed family child care provider and put a Y by each one of them? Is that what you're suggesting? There's already a row in the bylaw um, that states family child care mm -hmm. and that is then special permit is required um, except, except for in the PUD, it's allowed by right. I don't know why specifically the PUD. So you would just want to change that from a SP change everything from a change all the SPs to Ys. Okay, got it, got it. Sorry, it took me a while to understand. Yeah, no, I wasn't thinking about home occupation. Um, going here. I was only talking about family child care, which is a home occupation. That's why. That's what occurred to me. Um, do we want to apply apply any of the home occupation standards to it? Or do we want to just say you're a licensed family child care provider and you can just do it as long as you get your license? You know, like, 
I don't know what, but. Yeah, well, one one thought I was having is to sort of the, the issues that Ken raised, which I do, I understand what he's um, suggesting. I was thinking that we could handle it in the same manner that we do the Dover uses, where we do have an internal staff review. And if we if we think there's something, you know, where it might be more than a reasonable regulation of it, we would maybe have to bring it back to the board. But in this particular case, we'd probably then have to amend our rules and regulations to add this as sort of a, you know, as part of a staff review, essentially. But other than that, I was only thinking that we would change the table to from SP to Y, where it is currently in SP. Yeah, the, the reason I'm, I'm thinking about a little beyond that, now that I understand that, thanks, is, for example, the supplemental, supplemental regulations for home occupation in residential districts, you know, say things like any such building shall include no feature of design not customary in buildings for residential use. Um, no advertising devices visible, no more than a certain percentage of the floor area. I don't really know whether those are necessary, but I just wonder whether we want to put some limits like those on these in the residential district. I wouldn't put them on the, in the business districts or the other districts. But I'm just wondering in the residential districts whether I wouldn't want to say no to any of these, but whether we want to outline some limitations related to them. And I don't know what they would be on. All right. So <laughs> um, let's get comments from the other two board members. Perhaps they have some thoughts, Jean, to expand on what you just proposed, and then I think we can circle back to whether or not that's something we'd like to explore um, as, a, as an additional draft. Um, so I'll move on to Melissa for any questions or, or comments. Um, I, I mean, I feel generally, I understand kind of where, where this is coming from, I guess for, my understanding, does the town have complaints um, ever with these um, operations? Because I feel like that's what I've heard in the past that communities have dealt with, you know, a butter complaints, whether it's, you know, toys in the yard or noise and how that's handled currently in Arlington. I have not ever heard of complaints of this particular use, but that does not mean that there have not been complaints. Okay. Um, that's it right now. I think I need time to kind of think through some of this. Great, thanks Melissa. Steve? Yeah, I also would like some time to think through this. I do, um, I, I do kind of like the idea of treating it as or similar to uh, the way some of the Dover Amendment uses are, are treated. Um, I need to give it some more thought, though. Great. Thanks, Steve. And I just had one question, um, and it has to do with the licensing from the Department of Early Education and what, if any, um, on-site reviews, specifically if there is anything related to the neighborhood, the abutters, the suitability of um, the actual location in the home where a family child care program um, exists, if, if there is anything within the Department of Education review process. My understanding is that there is an on-site review or a review at least of the space where children will be, you know, occupying portion of a home or a space for, you know, some, part of the day as well as potentially outdoor activities. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else they might be looking for. I can certainly find that out and bring that back to the board. Great, thank you. And um, again, because I, I don't think any of us have, have had the opportunity to really look into this at any great length, do we know what some of our neighboring communities, how they um, address this? Um, as well as, is this something that goes through a special permit process in other communities or um, 
Is it purely through the licensing? The licensing and then a staff review. Licensing and the staff review like you proposed. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, that, that I think is, is what I would be in, in favor of. And, and Jenny, I appreciated your suggestion that if there were potentially concerns about um, abutters and the suitability of the, of the neighborhood, that it, there, there is some sort of escalation process built into this, especially for some of the larger um, facilities. As Ken, Ken pointed out, I think the difference between six and 10 families um, you know, coming and going within a neighborhood is not insignificant. So. Um, maybe let's take comments on all of these and then we'll circle back and, and um, talk about next steps at, as, as all, all three of these together. Um, so if we could move on to the zoning bylaw amendment for signs. Right, so, um, so this one comes from, you know, we're currently, we use, we have blue bikes in Arlington, which is a regional bike share program. We have docking stations. And those docking stations basically have a sign um, board that's, you know, at uh, one of one end of a station that usually has a sign that will say blue bikes. And then on the other side, there might be some sort of, and it's basically the sign is like advertising. It's like blue bikes and people happily riding bikes, you know, and some sort of ad related to blue bikes. The other side of the sign might be something that a community like, um, you know, poster, a farmer's market poster, some sort of community event um, coming up. I've seen a lot of different types of other signage that's on the opposite side of that sign. Um, the issue is we actually don't allow that type of sign um, in our bylaw. The other type, so that's blue bikes. The other type of similar sign is we've had electric vehicle charging companies contact us, they're private. Um, we have currently, um, actually, uh, with one, a couple of exceptions, we basically have only public electric vehicle charging stations. We have not yet had any private companies come and be able to install the charging stations because the way that they provide that service is by also putting up advertising for the charging station. Um, so it's kind of a similar situation where it's a dock, you know, with many different ports for your, uh, for electric vehicles. And then there's sort of signage um, that is essentially the nature of it is advertising. So we don't currently allow this um, in our sign bylaw. I, I don't think it's something that we necessarily missed. Uh, my point here is that we, while we amended it in 2019, we joined Blue Bikes after the fact. Um, so I don't think that we were ever in a position to like think about this particular uh, potential issue. So what I've recommended here is basically to add an exemption um, for these types of signs. And you know, I don't, I don't have the exact language for that, but something to the effect that it would be an exemption for signage located at shared mobility stations, um, which is the type of thing that I'm talking about. We could talk about some sort of staff review, which is what we do for most sign applications already, it goes to inspectional services and the Department of Planning and Community Development. So there wouldn't be, wouldn't just be you'd suddenly see, you know, blue certainly you certainly would not see blue bikes blue bike stations everywhere. You would only see the docking stations and the locations they're currently in. Um, with the situation of electric vehicle charging stations, that's of course only if the owner was interested in having a, that kind of charging station on their private property, but they would still have to go through some sort of permitting and review process, which would be through inspectional services and planning and community development. So um, my suggestion is to create an exemption just for this. Um, and that's where I'll stop. Great, thank you, Jenny. Uh, we'll take any questions for Jenny, starting with Ken. No, I have none. Okay, Jean? Yeah, I have a, a couple. So does the phrase shared mobility station cover both the electric charging or only the blue bikes? Or would we need a separate definition for shared mobility stations, which explain what they are? It, it would it could cover both but yeah you're right we probably should add a definition like we do for every other sign I think yeah maybe and then rather than exempting them I, I guess my my question about exempting them is if we exempt them then they can put up a huge huge sign wouldn't we want to instead of exempting them 
put some limits on the size and location and lighting and all the things we do on other sides? I think we, at least uh, Kelly, maybe you can jump in a little bit, but I think we, we found that there is a sign type that this relates to. It's just that it's not currently allowed in these types of locations. Um, I don't know if we, we want to talk about the exact sign type, but I mean, so I, I think that it does exist in terms of it, it being an exemption. It's not the same thing as, and I'm also not looking at the, the zoning bylaw right now, I'm sorry, but the sign bylaw has things that are basically allowed by right. This would not be like that. You know, so those are like directional signs and, um, you know, other types of things of, of that nature or emergency signage, et cetera. This is not that type of sign. It's an exemption. That's it. Except we have some exemptions where there's no review of the signs whatsoever. And I'm not thinking that we want this to be a complete exemption because I think we want to be able to have, make sure the signs don't get too big or in the wrong place or lit up 24 seven, something like that. So I agree that we need to regulate them or allow them, but I'm not sure the exemption is the way to do it, as opposed to setting up a specific set of requirements for shared mobility stations. It could be simple. They have to be on the station, nowhere else. You know, whatever size is the appropriate size for the sign. They can't be lit up at night. You know, just minor things like that, that I think would be better than an exemption. So you would basically, you would allow them through mm -hmm. a staff review, right. but would add basically a sign type. Yep, yep. That would be okay. my suggestion instead. Okay. Um, I think the only the only caveat would be is if we have the uh, design abilities of the uh, the company that basically drafted our sign by law oh. to add that sign type. But I think we could figure it out. And maybe Steve could take a crack at the uh, graphics. There, there, there are some um, private. Um, um, electric vehicle charging stations in town right now. I never yeah. I get at the Whole Foods. At the Whole Foods, exactly. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Those are my thoughts about that one. Great. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Melissa, any comments for Jenny? No. Okay. Steve, any comments? Yes. Um, I do like the idea of um, allowing these through staff review and opposing just some basic reasonable standards. Um, I mean, we, yeah, I, 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 I that's, yeah, I, 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 I concur with Mr. Benson and sure, I'm happy to try, take a, take a try at drawing one of these things. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Steve. I, I agree as well. I, I think that uh, um, a, a new sign type with staff review sounds appropriate to me as well. Um, okay, let's move to uh, the third, which is uh, non-conforming single family or two family dwellings. Um, and Jenny, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure. So this one came to me through town council, actually, and um, I, I admit, admittedly, I put this memo together, and then I did not have a chance to follow up with town council. And there have been some, there's actually been some correspondence between Jean and town council that perhaps Jean could share. Um, what I was proposing based upon the conversation with town council was to strike this section as um, what I was told is that it is in conflict with um, with a ruling, but um, Gene might shed some light on some other ideas that he had about how to handle this issue in the bylaw, which was not about striking it, but perhaps adding another, I think another subsection um, under 813 uh, that would perhaps address this issue. And I, I haven't caught up on that because I have not been in today, but I did see the correspondence. So if it's okay, Rachel, I'll let Gene. Please, yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just really briefly, the, the Comstock case is actually a Mass Appeals Court case, not a Superior Court case. There was a Superior Court case, but it was reversed by the Appeals Court. 
which I had the pleasure of reading this weekend. And um, I think this is right that section 8.1.3C conflicts with not only the ruling, but uh, 40A section six of the zoning code. The problem is I don't think, I think we want to amend it rather than strike it because I suggest replacing it with something else that I think is missing from 8.1.3. And I just sent that my suggestion back to town council just before this meeting. So we obviously hadn't had time to look at it. So it might say to, to strike or amend 8.1.3C because I think we do have to strike it because it clearly violates the ruling and the zoning code. The question is whether we want to replace it with what I think we should replace it with, which is something different, but I think is missing from 8.1.3. That, that would be my suggestion, just to strike or amend. And then we can work on, you know, with town council exactly what the main motion would be like. Okay, that's right. helpful. I, yeah. I didn't have anything else to add on this. Okay, way. that was all it. right. Thank you, Jenny. Ken, any any question? No, just wait. Well, just wait to see what comes out. Thanks. I, I agree. I think I'm um, hard for me to give any opinion without seeing the, the bigger picture, which it sounds like will be forthcoming in um, shortly. Uh, Melissa, any any questions or comments? Uh, no comment on this one. And see, I didn't have a comment on the other one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Steve? Uh, no comment on this, but a just sort of a tangent, um, since we're on the topic of case law and enforceability and that sort of stuff, there, I believe there is a, some, a zoning amendment that was passed at the last annual town meeting, which modified section 3.1, added a clause for requirements of a building permit and was ruled unenforceable by the attorney general. Um, you know, at, I'd like to put that on the list of things to administer administratively correct at some point. Noted. Jenny Actually, and I, literally. Jenny and I had a conversation about that a few months ago, and her thought was, at the least, we could put a footnote at that point in the zoning bylaw, just saying that this part was rule you know, couldn't be done by the attorney general. I, I think we may have done that, or at least we talked about doing that, yeah. Um, yeah. And we, we could still, we could do that now. Um, we've done that, for example, uh, related to the marijuana uses, which had a similar, not, not the same type of feedback, but feedback from the attorney general, um, clarifying a couple of points. Was so that related to the, that. just a point of clarification, was that related to the accessibility? Piece, which, which just, there were, there were several. It, it, was uh, related, it, was, it was related to the tree bylaw. And the tree bylaw, uh, yes, the one that cross-referenced. Right, yeah. right, and what the AG said is you can't in the zoning bylaw prohibit a permit that would otherwise be allowed if somebody didn't meet something that wasn't part of the zoning bylaw. Got That's it. a shortcut way yeah. of saying it. Got it. Okay, so um, it sounds like um, in terms of timing, the two timing options were, you know, one was to try and, and place a legal notice this Thursday. Um, um, it sounds like there is still a significant number of, of questions around um, both the child care piece and how that might be how that might be structured although I just looking here as to whether or not the motion is um, or the the wording is broad enough that that could be worked through in the main motion and, um, Kelly would you just bring that back up on the screen uh, so we can just look at the language really quickly because I'm, I'm thinking that there's a way to make them all broad enough in right. the warrant potentially right. Um, 
you know, and then that would give us opportunity to work through the wording as well as the, um, you know, the conversation around the, uh, the best way to move forward with that. Um, I think we had some consensus around the zoning amendment for, for signs and how, um, how, to, how to move forward there. Um, and then we definitely needed more information on the, the, the last item, but have identified that obviously something needs to be done to bring that to conformance. So I think we're able to alter the first and third in such a way that it's broad enough so that we can work, work through that as the main motion. Um, I feel comfortable moving these forward, but I'm interested to hear what, what others have to say. Jean? I think on the first one, the family child care, I mean, this may not get to Ken's concern about, do we wanna have them as a bride if they're 10 children? But if we're comfortable having them all as a bride, then I think we just wanna add something here. Um, and to set standards or requirements. And because that would allow us to do what I think a lot of us want to think about, which was, are we gonna, are we gonna put some standards and requirements that they must meet? Um, so I think that's one way to think about. It. On the other hand, if Ken thinks that, or others think that maybe we don't want to allow them all as of right then I don't think we can go ahead yet. Could we perhaps look at this as, I believe that there was another one where we, I think it was the solar piece where we tried to make it as, where we tried to make it broad by identifying as, as of right um, with certain exceptions. And then we worked through what those exceptions were um, or exemptions. Uh, well, that was the opposite. It was, it was more that, that there were exemptions as opposed to, again, this would be the opposite in terms of, you know, there's a more stringent requirement in certain, um, if the staff escalates. So is there a way to build in the escalation process into the way that this is written? I'm okay with this going forward right now uh, with the fact that we can uh, make uh, some changes to it. I, I'm just asking this, I'll ask this to Jenny, do you feel like you have enough time between now and then to make some changes, you know, uh, or just have some rules set aside that we can agree upon that uh, once you can't, you feel like you need to be brought up higher up, it would go to us, but otherwise you handle it all. I have no problem with you guys handling it to a certain limit. And then once it gets beyond a certain limit and you've, or something, you can bring it up to us and say, hey, look, this is much, you know, this is 10 now, or this is 12 now, or whatever. Uh, you know, I think having four or five is not, not an issue. It's just a large family, you know? So I'm okay with that. Does that make sense? All right. Um, are there any concerns with moving forward with these um, as currently amended um, and uh, posting on, on Thursday so that we can move forward. And I'll say, I, I, um, I think that if we're able to do this in the first option with um, having a, uh, let's see, the, this Thursday with the legal notice, the seventh, um, meeting and then the 25th voting on, on this, that that would be preferred for, for me personally, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people think as well. Ken? I'll be okay with that. Jean? Yeah, I think all of the dates seem like they would work for me. Steve? Um, I'm okay with either timetable. And Melissa? So far, I'm okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I think we, we should jump, just double check if 6.2.3 is the right section there, Kelly. It's, it's one of the right sections because we still do need to make a clause in that section, but we do, we would need to address the other, you know, adding 
a sign right. type. So there may be a second section you want to There's add. a second section, definitely, yeah. So that okay. section that I referenced in this draft is, um, essentially it says, uh, not essentially, actually, it says um, that it's a restriction to have a sign on a public way. It's, uh, it's in that, that category of signs. I'm sorry, I'm just... Yeah, I just want to make sure we have all the right sections in the warrant article yes. so we don't say after, oops. Yeah, yeah no, 6.2.3 is necessary. And uh -huh. then One more. Um, I suppose it's just the next, the next section after. I think we I'm also need to include, I'm, I'm sorry, um, temporary signs because blue bikes are at sometimes are um, right. seasonal. I think it might be 6.2.5 where it's the It, it could just back. be 6.2, you know, and we can, right. we can get into the nitty gritty. Right. That's a good idea. Um, you know, once we, once we have to dive into everything that needs, because I, th I think that we're getting we're, we're aware okay. that there's many parts to this. Yep, yes. good idea. I think that makes sense. And that's broad and enough. We're gonna get rid of allow an exemption, right? To create a new sign type. Yeah, we'll just okay. delete that. Okay. Well, to, well, to, um, I think it would still sa say to allow uh, related to shared mobility stations. Yeah, yeah. I see what you're editing. Sorry, Kelly. Right, <laughs> right. Great. And I see um, that Christian Klein has his hand up. Christian, I'm not sure if you had um, some perspective from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, perspective that you were, were looking to share. Um, uh, th thank you. Um, Christian Klein, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, there's been a lot of discussion back and forth uh, between the Zoning Board and Council in regards to the third item. Um, which has to do with vested rights and uh, both the decision listed there, the Balada decision from, 2000, uh, from 2019 in Brookline. Um, and this is definitely something we, we would prefer that the, uh, the ARB try to take up um, in time for a special town meeting. Great, I appreciate your perspective. And I think that um, on, on this one too, it would be something that since the, the ZDA has, has been in some discussion back and forth. It would be um, great once we get to the hearing to um, you know have have an a, a opinion officially from the ZBA on, on on your thoughts on this. Absolutely, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, any other uh, questions or comments from the from the board on these three proposed warrant articles? I think what we would need is a motion um, to, um, let's craft this. So a motion to um, approve the uh, submission uh, of these warrant articles as amended, as amended for um, a spring special town meeting. Does that sound appropriate, Jenny? Can, can, I just ask, can I just ask one yes. more question before we yep. take the vote? In the article about child care, and I don't know, Jenny, do we need a definition of family child care added to the zoning bylaw? I mean, it wouldn't hurt, and we could just use the definition that I put right there from Department of Early Ed. Okay, great. I mean, we could, you know, the same way we were adding shade tree, public shade tree, and okay. we referenced state law, we could do a similar thing here. Okay, great. That was it, just wanted to check. Great, Rachel, I would just say if you could also vote to add a meeting date. I, yep. I lost track of whether or not that, you, you talked about it, but I didn't know if we all agreed. Okay, so is there a motion to, um, so we need to add another meeting date. So let's talk through what date that would be. So we had said April 7th, we would need to, um, Kelly, I'm going to have you run through the time. Sorry, I don't think you want to interrupt. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if, if they're able to get this in to the advocate on Thursday, yes, then we can hold a hearing on the 7th, which is the That's same hearing. You're voting on the report to town meeting. Yep. 
And then on the 25th, which is the next scheduled ARB hearing or meeting date, you could have a vote. Okay. So then you would not need to add an additional hearing date. If, right. if we cannot do this, if we can't get the ad to the advocate for a legal notice on Thursday, then we need to seek a different date to, to have that intermediate date in there too. Right. So we have, we have a meeting scheduled on the 7th, but we don't have a public hearing identified for that date for the Warren article. So that's just what we need to add to the motion, correct? Okay. So is there a motion to um, approve uh, submission of these three uh, Warren articles for special town meeting as amended with the addition of a hearing date of April 7th um, for, the, uh, for the three Warren articles? I, I Clarification. So we're going to have the yep. hearing on the 7th. We're going to vote on the 25th, which is yes. our next meeting. Yes. When do we approve the report to special town meeting? Would that be on May 2nd, our next meeting after that? Or is that too late? No, I think that that's fine. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. And I would just suggest that we might add, we might need to meet a little bit earlier on both of those days. We'll see where we're at on the 7th. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. I'm just making a note. Um, is there a motion or is there someone who would like to move as I just suggested? I move like you just suggested. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. I'll take a vote, Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Eve? Yes. And then a yes as well. Okay. So that concludes agenda item number two. Get back to my agenda. Uh, and we now go to agenda item number three, which is the town bylaw warrant article discussion. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, Jenny and I met with um, the chair of the select board and uh, the town manager and uh, I think town council joined us. I think it was just the four of us um, to talk through the uh, warrant articles that we had requested that the select board take up and review. And um, they requested our input on three warrant articles. Um, all three of these, um, it appears from their agenda that they reviewed last Monday. And um, I believe that they are, um, their procedure is that they vote on the articles that they've heard the prior meeting date. So they would um, actually vote on these next, this, this coming Monday. Um, so the three that they asked us to weigh in on were Article 9, which is a bylaw amendment uh, achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions from town facilities consistent with the town of Arlington's net zero action plan, Article 73. Um, which is related to the resolution proposed for a true net zero opt-in code for cities and towns um, in Article 17, which is a bylaw amendment for the conversion of gas station dispensing pumps to self-service operation from full service. So um, I will open this up for discussion. Basically what our goal is this evening is to identify any feedback that this board might have so that we can put this together in a memo um, for the select board. If we choose not to take a position on any of these, that can be um, included in the memo, but if we have specific um, support or questions, concerns, um, thoughts that we'd like to share with them, this is our opportunity here. So I think I'll run through and, um, you know, again, take us through individually and ask for any comments on any of these these three, uh, starting with Ken. Oh, Rachel, I actually was looking for these articles. I, I could not find them. So I did not, um, maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. I could not, I, I have no comment right now. Yeah, it was a little bit challenging. Um, I was able to find them. You know, the only place I was able to find them with the full and actually it wasn't even the full main motion, it was just town council's memo um, was in the agenda for 
the select board last week. So I apologize. We, we probably should have um, included that. And I honestly didn't even realize that until today when I went to look for them and realized that I couldn't find them either. So um, uh, maybe we'll start. Um, we can come back to you. I, I, I sure. had a couple of, of thoughts that, you know, just from reading those that, that I had. But uh, Jean, I think you were perhaps involved in one of these, correct, through the Clean Energy Future? I, I was not because I'm not on the committee, although I attend. You've been interfacing, right. OK. But did you have I, yeah, I, I, I personally am in favor of um, the two, the one that's, um, let me call it up on my screen for a second. The one that achieves net zero greenhouse gas emissions from town facilities and the uh, net zero opt-in code for cities and towns. I think they're both critically important for us if we're gonna achieve um, net zero. Um, I have not read the third one on uh, dispensing pumps to self-service. I think my, but my general feeling is that there should be self-service pumps in Arlington, but not to the exclusion of somebody coming out and pumping for people who want it. And there should be no difference in price between the two. That's my thought on the third. But it's, it actually speeds it up if people don't have to wait for the attendant to come out and you know put it in and then wait for him to come back or her to come back, that's usually him to pull out the pump, the nozzle when the car is done. So yeah, so I'm, I'm in favor of that, but not to the exclusion of having the other one. The option. Didn't be any difference in price. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jean. And I think uh, just related to the other two, the two, the resolution and also the net zero, um, greenhouse gas emissions from town facilities. A lot of that, from my understanding of reading the memo from town council, and Jean, you can expand on this perhaps, is um, really related to um, clean clean energy um, usage as opposed, you know, so eliminating fossil fuel-based um, gas sources for, for that, that's tied in significantly to, to both of these. And then the net zero opt-in code for cities and towns also would include um, items like um, standards for envelope um, design, whether it's to passive house or some other um, envelope standard that's beyond what the current stretch code today has. Yeah, well, that's right. I, yeah, I have nothing to add to that other than it's not clear that the building, whatever they are, are actually going to put out a good enough code, but yeah. Right. The state building code officials. As Thank you. Yes, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Whatever they're called. Yeah. 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 They may not get to real net zero. So Article 9 is that the town would buy energy from a producer that, uh, that doesn't, uh, that generates electricity with non-greenhouse emissions. Is that the simple thing is that, or? No, no my understanding is that they would, um, they would prioritize solar on site and that they would also um, that they would uh, that they would design their the town systems for major renovations and new buildings um, to run uh, basically on, a, on electric um, heat and water sources as opposed to natural gas or other um, other uh, other sources of, the, of that type. So they're going to rely. They're going to rely purely on solar and wind or geothermal to create and electric, all electric. And but what what generates electric? Is it is well? That's the whole point, right? That that's that's I think the challenge that some people have with the what is really clean clean energy and when you um, move to all electric versus um, versus natural gas. I mean, in some ways, the two answers to that is you can opt in to 100% um, renewable electric right now, which just costs more. But is can, that what this article is saying, Gene? That's what I'm no, saying. 
No, but I mean, you could, but alternatively, you know, the state's going to have to have the grid be carbon neutral in another some number of years. So, but I think it just requires net zero. I don't recall if it says how they're going to get to net zero building. There, there were a few strategies. Here, let me actually, I think I saved it to my desktop because I wanted to be able to refer back to it. I didn't save it, so I don't have any yeah. I'm sorry, Richard. Do we have to do we have to vote on this today? That's what you're saying? Fortunately, we do because you know, if we want to submit anything, um, what we could do is you know, just have a discussion today. We could ask, gosh, they will probably need um, anything we do submit by. Thursday this week to, to post because they have a meeting on Monday when they're going to vote on these. Um, so we would need to get any comments probably by end of day tomorrow, um, you know, to, to collate to, to Jenny and, and Kelly if we wanted to um, add anything to our discussion this evening and, and get it to the select board in time for their meeting. Jenny, is there any additional time in that timeline, or I'm assuming that their process is similar to ours. Um, I would say, you know, Wednesday is probably fine. Well, Rachel, just send, I, I, to send I, comments. I, that is to me. I don't want to hold you guys one, back. One if the rest of you four member boards uh, want to go ahead and comment on it and approve it, uh, I think you just you'll be fine. I'll just abstain and go from there. Okay. Uh, if that sounds fair, Rachel. If you, if you feel comfortable with that, and like I said, what I what I would like to do, Ken, is um, forward the the notes that I was able to find. You know, again, the town council prepared for the select board related to these three articles, and that way, if you have a chance to review them and you have any additional comments that you'd like to share with Jenny by you know end of day Wednesday, you have that opportunity. Sure, I have no problem with that. Okay, great. Jenny, can you send me the articles too, or? Uh, we can try to find, I, I don't know how much more detail exists, but I will do my best. I mean, the articles are in the, in the warrant, which is that somewhere? I in the think the main system? motion, the main motions oh. aren't, but I couldn't find the main motions. The, the main yeah. motion. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can find. All right. Thank you. I, I don't want, you know, comment on something that I haven't read. Fair enough. Uh, Melissa, any any thoughts or comments on these three articles? Um, I pro I probably need to look at it closer too. I mean, I think um, in theory I support this, but I haven't looked at the details of it, and so I have to do that. So I'd be interested in the comments. Okay. From town council. Great. Um, Steve. Any thoughts? Yes, um, having read only the text of the warrant, um, I, I suspect I will be very supportive of Article 9. Article 73 sounds nice, but it's just a resolution and, you know, asking the State Department of whatever State Department to adopt a, a net zero opt-in code. Um, for Article 17, I don't have any real concerns about self-service gas stations. Uh, that said, um, I plan would, that said, those are initial opinions and I'd like the opportunity to go through the select boards packet and um, locate town council's memo and give that a look. Great. So I think at this point, um, I don't know that we're gonna be able to, to vote on anything specific. Um, what I would suggest is that um, we identify that um, we need to improve this process going forward in the future and have them send to us the, because I'll be sending Steve the DeCourcy, the, the notes that the department has put together for those um, items that, that we've asked them to, to look for that we request their, their meeting notes ahead of time as well. And, um, you know, we collate any, um, any comments we have together for um, a memo uh, by sending any comments um, to Jenny and, and, and Kelly by 
end of day Wednesday. Um, it sounds to me like we're generally supportive of seven, or excuse me, of nine and 73. I like Jean, um, after reviewing the documents, I'm in favor of um, the amendment allowing self-service operation with a full service option um, as, as well. Um, I, I don't see any from a, again, from a redevelopment board standpoint, um, any, any concerns that, that I have after reading the memo. Um, but we'll, we'll ask um, that, again, what I can do is this evening, I'll, I'll forward what I, I was able to find, the, the letter from town council um, to the select board. I'll, I'll uh, send that to everybody to take a look at. All right. Um, let's see. Any other um, comments from the board on the Warren article discussion? All right. Um, so that closes uh, agenda item number three. Great. Um, yep. Uh, just Rebecca Gruber had her hand up. I'm guessing she might have had a question or a comment. Okay. I, I'll definitely get to her during the open forum. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just want to recognize that. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so that closes agenda item number three, and we'll now move to agenda item number four, which is uh, open forum. So any member of the public wishing to uh, speak this evening, uh, please use the raise hand function and we will um, call on you to speak. Uh, so I uh, see one person, Rebecca Gruber. Um, please note that you, we'd like you to address, uh, identify yourself by your first, last name and address and you will have up to three minutes to uh, address the board. So, Rebecca. Thank you, uh, Rebecca Gruber, 215 Pleasant Street. Um, just in reference to your last discussion and not in any way to imply that I could possibly speak for the select board, but at their last meeting, they did not vote on the previous meetings warrant articles. So there's clearly some opportunity for you all to consider this further, if that would be something that fit for you and for the select board. Um, so I know they have a process, but I watched them not make a vote on a warrant that they had discussed at their prior meeting and put it off for at least another meeting, so. I appreciate that feedback, thank you. Uh, any other members of the public with us this evening who um, wish to speak? All right, seeing none, we will close. There's, uh, there's the actually one more. Oh, thank you, I missed that. Um, uh, yes, um, number one, I wanna- Sorry, I need that. to recognize you first. Um, so oh, Thomas Allor, if you could again, introduce yes. yourself first, um, last name and address. Thank you. Tom Allor, 151 Massachusetts Ave. Um, and with regards to the article of uh, the expanded business district zoning, how does the board decide that they want to um, move that to town meeting? What is the process, please? So uh, the the process by which um, we'll be reviewing every all of the eighteen Warren articles, um, we'll hear all of the hearings. Um, this is our second night of four nights, and then on April fourth. Um, we will, uh, the board um, will review uh, based on all of the discussion we've heard, all of the public comment we've received. We'll debate each one of the um, individual Warren articles um, individually and we'll vote either um, to take action. So to move the, um, move the Warren article to town meeting or we'll vote no action um, and we will not recommend that it move forward to, to town meeting but that will happen on April 4th. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great, uh, any other uh, members of the public with any questions or comments? Great. Rebecca, uh, did you have another comment? I'm just, I see your hand is still up and I just wanna make sure I, if you have something else that I don't miss, miss you. You're good? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Let's see, so with that, we will um, close agenda item number four. Uh, any other items from the board before we have a motion to adjourn? I have 
Two quick, quick things. Great. One, one is uh, tomorrow evening at five, we are having the tour of Central School or the Community Center. We're actually, I just got an email, the time, the, the location where we're going to meet is in the front of the building. So come to the front Maple Street entry at the sort of half moon space, can't miss it, has a bright shiny entry now. Um, so we're going to meet there. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to just give an update on is the housing production plan is going to be before the select board on the 23rd. And that same evening, we are going to have a presentation, basically the same presentation on MBTA communities with the board. So we'll be doing both. And I just wanted to give you that update because it's been some time has passed. That was Thank it. you, Jenny. I'm sorry, was there somebody else? Okay, um, so what we will do, um, just to circle back for, um, you know, for agenda item number three, we'll get the comment, we'll send you the documents, we'll um, ask you to send any comments to Kelly and Jenny, if I'll also reach out to Steve DeCourcy to find out when they will be voting, if that is in fact, um, per Rebecca's, um, per Rebecca's uh, note, if that is going to be on Monday, um, if it's not, then we will have the opportunity, obviously, to chat about it at our next meeting, but we'll see what we can find out. All right, uh, so with that, is there a motion to adjourn? A motion. A All right, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. All right, Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you all and have a great evening. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.